Okay, good evening, uh, members, good evening, visitors, and uh, to anybody watching online, welcome to you, and thank you very much for joining us this evening for this uh, overview and scrutiny board meeting of BCP Council. My name is Steve Butler, I'm the chairman of this board. Um, before we uh, go on with the agenda, I'll ask Democratic Services to uh, give us the housekeeping uh, instructions for the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Please note that this meeting is being recorded by the Council for live broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. The meeting may also be recorded or streamed for live or subsequent broadcast by members of the public, although ultimate discretion in this matter lies with the chair in case of disruption. For those in the room, please note that if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by where the nearest available sign fire exit route and make your way to the assembly point in the front car park of this building. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. For those in the room, this includes turning off microphones and turning the volume down completely on your laptops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so agenda item one, apologies. Do we have any apologies? Apologies from Councillor Aikenhead and also apologies from Councillor Broadhead. And do we have any substitute members? Councillor Canavan will be substituting for Councillor Aikenhead and Councillor Beasley will be substituting for Councillor Broadhead. Thank you. Um, declarations of int interest. Uh, do any councillors have any disclosable pecuniary interests or any other interests on any items on the agenda? Councillor Dedman. I don't, I don't know if it is a declaration of interest, but I'm on the, hang on, cross-party strategic asset disposal working group who looked at this before, so I don't know if that makes me um, conflicted. I don't believe that makes you conflicted, I just, just check with democratic services. You don't want us to declare any interest. Uh, you know. yeah, please, please, of... please, please declare it and, and then I'll give you a response. Thank you. <laughs> OK, if I could then declare that I um, I, I actually chaired that uh, working group. I, I think. But, yeah, uh, Councillor Cameron. I better declare that I was there as well, Chair. Okay. I think you know what I'm going to say. Are there any more? <laughs> I'm also on that group. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, uh, we don't believe you have a conflict of interest and you can participate in this meeting. Thank you. But having said that, it is nice to know that, uh, you know, that you were actually on that committee at the same time. It's Councillor Dove. Thank you, just for noting that I'm the Ward Councillor for the agenda item that's coming up. So just to note that I'm the Ward Councillor for the agenda item that's coming up. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. Uh, thanks. OK, so uh, agenda item five. Uh, sorry, agenda item four, confirmation of minutes. Does anybody have any uh, comments to make on the minutes as published? See no dissent from that, so we'll take those as accurate. Thank you. Uh, agenda item uh, five, public issues. I believe we do have some public issues. Uh, Democratic services, thank you. Yes, Chairman, we have three statements this evening. Um, one from Siobhan Harrington um, and one from Will Bikeman and one from Cecilia Bufton. Thank you. So, uh, Siobhan Harrington, would you like to come up, please, and make your statement? Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for enabling us to come and speak tonight. Uh, this is a win-win decision. The land has unique value to NHS and our partners. Health-led campus leads to high quality jobs like research and education. We need more homes, especially for the NHS key workers 
who will walk to work. University Hospitals Dorset is an environmental custodian who can make this a net zero site. This proposal is popular. It's common sense use of the land and it's supported by neighbouring landowners. We're local with a long term view. We have every interest in making this work. Expert opinion has set the price following due process, so a fair deal for taxpayers. We've developed a joint vision for the site over many years. BCP are no longer leading on developing the site, and we believe UHD is best placed to progress this. Our track record includes delivering the £24 million pathology hub, £30 million for electrical upgrade, and net zero buildings. We are keen to further deliver with partners the vision for this site. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Rob William, Chairman of the University Hospital Dorset. Thank you. I'm Rob. <laughs> Rather than repeat it all, um, we're keen to work in partnership uh, for the benefit of all our residents. This means uh, taking a one estate approach um, for public value. We've prepared a briefing for stakeholders um, on our intentions, and as a public body, we've made that available. That's online, and so your uh, democratic services uh, officers will have uh, that link. And we're also keen to meet and discuss this with uh, with our partners and with councillors. This is our first opportunity to address councillors, so we appreciate that. Thank you very much. And to help explain um, the um, and uh, progress, we've also prepared a short video, which I don't think you're playing tonight, Chair, but again is, is available for you all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And I believe uh, you're going to be reading a statement from Cecilia Burton. Who's the, who's the chair of the uh, Dorset Local Enterprise Partnership? She's not here, unfortunately. I think Richard's, oh, Richard's going to be here. Okay, okay come on, Richard. Thank you. I've left the mic on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I I'm here to speak on behalf of Cecilia Bufton, the chair of the Dorset Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, I'm speaking to support the proposal that the council sells the Wessex Field site to University Hospitals Dorset. The economy of BCP is stagnating in part because innovative entrepreneurial private sector businesses are priced out of the area, unable to find affordable office and manufacturing locations and unable to find highly skilled people they need due to the high cost of living in the area. The LEP, our universities and colleges have invested in health and care innovation and related skills development. To maximise the potential of converting ideas into business, we need to start up and grow on facilities adjacent to our hospitals and university sites. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, members, uh, agenda item six, which is our main item on the agenda this evening, and that's of the Wessex Fields. Um, before we go, go on to a debate on this, I'd just like to say that um, there was a commercial, there are commercial elements to the report, the confidential uh, matters. If anybody wishes to talk about any of the confidential issues, then we will have to go into closed session, and the public will be excluded. OK, so it may not be necessary, but please just be careful and mindful of that uh, when you're speaking. All right. So um, I said that I'm going to now. I'm, I think uh, is it uh, the leader of the council introducing us like Ca Councillor Cox? OK, I wondered. I wasn't quite sure. So Councillor Cox, would you like to introduce a paper for us, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wasn't actually going to be here, but uh, I came here to support the leader, but she's then, as my name is on the report, I uh, suddenly realised I'm going to have to present the report, so 
uh, highly unprepared for this, but uh, I'll give it a go. Um, I, as, as I've already said, the, the report's in my name and I'm delighted to bring it forward uh, because I, I do feel that this is uh, this would be a really excellent uh, thing to do for the council um, and I'm looking for the cabinet to approve it. Uh, I, I can't say any, anything better than has already been said by Siobhan, actually. I thought she, her, her words were, were absolutely spot on in terms of it being a win-win for the council and for the hospital. Um, this site, since it was bought in, in 2017, has been through various stages and various uh, in public engagements. It's uh, It's been sat on at the desk of, uh, of, uh, of BCP Future Places for quite a few years. And, and it's about time we did something with it. Uh, and, and there is something that we can do with it, which will be um, for the benefit of uh, of all of BCP and beyond. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to to put it forward uh, and ask any questions as you may wish to ask. I'll probably pass those on to the leader, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Cox. Did you still have anything to start, leader? Yeah, I just wanted to add that obviously this has been to the strategic asset working group, but I think um, partly due to timing and partly due to people being on holiday, I think the report that went to the group probably wasn't uh, as well formed as what we've got here tonight. Um, we have had, I do have a copy of the presentation uh, that has been sent um, and I'd be more than happy to share it, um, you know, which actually goes through what the uh, the UHD hospital would like to do with it. I've also had confirmation uh, recently that um, other local stakeholders are very supportive of this sale and uh, have written to us to ask that it goes ahead swiftly. So concerns that we may have had about this uh, when it was first put to us, when I came to you, um, scrutiny not before last, where there were things we weren't sure there were there risks attached, those risks seem to have um, dissipated to some extent uh, and I think the, the suggestion that we go ahead with this swiftly and start getting shovels in the ground so that we can develop this site seems wholly sensible. There has been um, a Red Book valuation done independently. Uh, we are commissioning a second Red Book independent valuation which will be ready before uh, before a final decision is taken on this just to give us the assurance if anybody was a bit worried that perhaps you know there was it perhaps wasn't a robust valuation that they were double checking it. The whole point of a red book valuation is to allow one public organisation to sell to another public organisation without both organisations spending thousands, tens of thousands or even more on legal costs and lost time. So, you know, I think this is um, a very exciting opportunity and I think the public will, it will be um, at least disappointed, if not very upset, if we pass up the opportunity um, to to get this site developed for what uh, it was designed to do. Thank you, Lena. Now, before I open it over to debate, I just wanted to clarify one 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 point. And um, I I know uh, uh, we were offered a presentation on behalf of the hospital this evening. Um, I, would, I didn't agree to that, and the reason was I, I had seen the minutes of the uh, Asset Disposal Group, and I saw there was potentially some conflict in that paper, which I think Lydia has just referred to, the issues that may now have been resolved. And I felt it was unreasonable to allow one side of the story, the, the other side presenting uh, at, at the same time. And I'd had no um, indication from any other bodies uh, uh, that, that they wish to present. Um, but if you're wondering why I didn't accept the invitation to present, that's the reason for it, because I've got to be extremely careful uh, in the way that some of these matters, and I think you'll understand the sensitivities of it. Uh, but nevertheless, we we probably will come into some part of that discussion at some point during. But I just wanted to explain my position. It was just to make sure that I didn't tread on anybody's toes, particularly legal toes, uh, in, in allowing one side to present, not necessarily the other. Um, Councillor Devon. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as I said, I, I, I do sit on the Strategic Asset Disposal Working Group, which is a ridiculously long title. Um, and the point of that group 
is to aid transparency in the disposal process for council owned surplus assets. Now, my question to the portfolio holder or indeed the leader is, can we be assured that we are being transparent and it is we are not going to get um, a problem later on? And I think that was the gist of everything that we said at that cross party working group. And this is now a can now all be clarified. So a sort of a question really, um, <coughs> leader, councillor, um, chairman, I'm <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> I'm forgetting who's who. Th th thank you, uh, councillor Dubman. Uh, councillor Cox's name is on the paper, so I'll address it to him in the first instance. No, no, he I, to I think, I elsewhere. Think I think, thank you. And uh, I think we're being completely transparent in, in, in all of this. You know, um, it's, we're, we're not trying to hide anything from anybody. This is all public. Um, and um, so there's there's no there's no hiding behind secret meetings or anything like that. This is this is being held in public. Uh, everybody knows about it, and um, people who you know who have a have a chance to buy it, uh, there's also have also been informed. So this stuff. Chairman, I I don't know if it is another conflict of interest, but I've just remembered that when we came down here in the 1980s, we put a bid in for that land with Slough Estates. But then we sold it on. So nothing to do with now. But it just shows how long this has been going on. The land behind the hospital. So we were going to build something wonderful. Oh, something like and then we just. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Tedman. Councillor Tarling. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm interested to hear that uh, you uh, didn't take the offer of the presentation. Up. Um, some of the questions that I've got would relate probably to that presentation. Um, I understand that you, obviously, there's a. You don't want to hear too much one side of the story, but uh, as I understand it, the purpose of overview and scrutiny is to is to get as m many of the facts as we possibly can. And I think it's up to the, this uh, this board to determine whether it's fact or or opinion um, or or a certain view. And I, I think as a as a as a board, we we could do that. Uh, so for my part, I, I would actually like to see the presentation if that is possible. Okay. Thank you. Um... <laughs> without having to repeat myself at the time I was asked there were other parties involved and uh, there were uh, certainly some legal issues which had great sim sensitivity in the information and I'm sure you will have discussed that at the meeting uh, that you were at and uh, so you were you were on the asset disposal you were I beg your pardon you were not okay well there were some and maybe you've not seen the minutes had you seen the minutes which I have been privy to, then I think you probably, and as with most reasonable people, have come to the same conclusion that in order to make sure that this debate was properly balanced and not open to any challenges, particularly legal ones, uh, in the way that the matter was handled, then this is why I took the decision at that point. And, and, uh, uh, and I still uh, maintain that position. Thank you. So, uh, members, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Cox. Can, can I just say, I think that the reason for you not, I understand the reason for you not, not listening, you know, wanting the presentation uh, in the circumstances. However, you know, the, the reason for for not has now gone um, because, um, you know, the, the threats that were there or the potential threats that were there have gone. And therefore, I don't see any any problem uh, with, with listening to it now. So that's okay. Yeah, I did read the report very carefully and I noted that there was a comment in there that some of that conflict had now disappeared. Uh, however, there was also a comment that you were awaiting a letter uh, to confirm that. I have not seen that letter, so I've never ever, no evidence that that conflict has actually disappeared. So uh, unless someone can show me that letter and then that objection to the presentation is withdrawn, then I will have absolutely no trouble whatsoever in allowing the presentation to go ahead. Thank you. Leader. Thank you, Chair. Perhaps perhaps I could just clarify the situation as I understand it. You may have a different understanding. I'm going to be very careful not to mention anything I'm not supposed to mention. When we did the previous meeting, one of the one of the matters that was raised by one of the members of the committee was the risk of a legal challenge if a purchase was done without there being an open market sale. 
I believe that's what you're referring to in reference to the strategic asset working group. And I remember saying that I was very worried. I did not want to put the council at risk of any legal challenge. And that that was one of the things that was making me a bit nervous. Yeah, um, that remained the position. I received an email from um, Graham Farrant, who's sadly not with us in person because he's just become a granddad. Congratulations, Graham. Uh, so he's away uh, visiting his new grandchild. Um, that we did receive an email on Thursday, 5.43 p.m., which means it was after any you know, letters, any posts would have been able to have been sent, uh, that was addressed to Sarah Good, Adam Richards, uh, and members of the hospital and other, uh, other stakeholders that states, Dear Sarah and Adam, I would like to confirm that on behalf of a number of stakeholders, we are happy for the sale to proceed and we fully support this transaction. I'm happy to provide letters from each stakeholder on Tuesday in time for your spirit review committee if required. Now, it appears those letters have physically arrived, um, but, you know, that has been shared with all the senior officers here who have clarified, uh, and Graham has passed it to me, that the person, the organisation that we felt would be challenging if there was likely to be a challenge, um, because of the assurances they've seen in the report and the discussions that have been had with the hospital are now supporting the sale of this to the hospital. And I think it's a real shame if the public don't get the opportunity to see you have a full debate based upon a, 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 an assumption. But that you're the chair, that's your decision. But I do have a copy of the presentation or I could defer to the people from the hospital to present it themselves if, if they preferred, because if they don't have a copy with them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Richards. Chair, yeah, just to highlight, um, section 29 of the report actually goes into set out the names of those individuals um, and those organisations that we're that we're very carefully trying to avoid mentioning. <laughs> okay, okay uh, Councillor Trent. Thank you, Chair. As I seem, see, seem to be almost one of the minority of people who aren't on the asset <laughs> disposal working group, um, I'm wondering whether to fully understand what the concerns were, perhaps we should have had a confidential presentation as to the background of this before we actually discuss the item, because, um, you know, it kind of, you know, it leaves you scratching your head, but what was this all about? you know, sort of um, things seem quite straightforward to me, but obviously if there were reasons of concern, but it does sound as if they are at least um, resolved. But, um, you know, I do think it would have been perhaps useful to have had just a short briefing in confidential to say why there were these concerns in the first place, and then that would make it a lot easier to make a decision based on the rest of the discussion. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Trent. Um, of course, it seems I had the advantage of seeing the minutes of the Asset Disposal Working Group, and um, you know, which was really quite clear in in, in what it said and, and the recommendations that it made. Um, so we are where we are now. So, um, uh, Councillor Moore. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I can sort of give a, a, a an outline now, uh, not in confidential. So I'm just I know I've got to be careful what I say, but I can do it if you would like me to. OK, just before you do that, um, what I'd say from from what I've been told now, if, if I have the assurance that those, those letters are, are on the way and we will see it, and they do alleviate those concerns, particularly the the, the uh, legal challenge that was mentioned that the uh, asset dispersal working group, then I, I, I would be uh, Intend to see the presentation. Um, uh, I would also say it's not the only reason I was reluctant because I don't generally like presentations during meetings. We like to see the work done before the meeting uh, because the meeting is not to collect evidence or it, it is basically to discuss the reports that we've been presented. My view was that there was sufficient information in the report. Uh, that actually would enable us to move forward. And you look, need to look carefully at the recommendation, which actually is not much of a recommendation, really, because it actually asks the cabinet to choose one of two options. Uh, so, you know, if, if that was the only thing that we were looking at, then it's very easy to, to agree with, isn't it? 
but of course, I think that we're expected to do a little bit more than that uh, this evening, uh, which I, I think we will. But having said that, then uh, let's just uh, hear from uh, uh, Councillor Moore. Oh, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Rutchins, before you come back. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just before perhaps the, 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 the Chair of the, the Strategic Cross Party Asset Disposal Working Group comes in, just to highlight that as Appendix 3 in this report is a copy of the confidential presentation that was given by myself and um, Sarah to that meeting, including the at that stage in the timeline, the concerns that we had on the table, which I think was a heavy influencer on the um, final recommendation of that group um, going forward, um, you know, it gave the background to that, um, and I think that was, you know, some of the the issues that perhaps Councillor Moore will now refer to. Yeah, and it was looking at that plus having read the minutes that gave me the concern and draw me to the decision that I came to. So let's now hear from Councillor Moore. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to say that um, there is a copy of the report um, in, in the confidential bit, and I understand that a copy of the minutes have actually been sent to everybody uh, just prior to the meeting. I'm not sure everybody's read, had a chance to read it. It was only about half an hour before the meeting, but I have seen them. Um, but if I could just say that was then, and this is now, and you know, this, this, um, a little bit of time has made quite a lot of difference. But what I can say is, oh, and also I would like to say that that uh, working group is only advisory. And I'll just call it the working group because it's just too long to keep saying it. Um, and, and it is only advisory. We don't make decisions. So um, many members of the working group were actually very supportive of the UHD proposals to develop the site for medical health technology and research with hospital key worker housing. They also noted UHD's intention to build a spine road through the site to connect uses and aspire to connect Wessex Link Road to Deansley Road if able to acquire an additional plot of land. In addition, the working group noted the UHD proposal was in line with their approved principles, especially principles four and five, and that the disposal was supported by the Council's asset management strategy, which is detailed in sections 20 and 22 of the report to the, to the board. However, concerns were raised at the meeting about the nursing home being in the middle of the site, the high cost of building the spine road, which was felt to be key to opening up the site for development, and that a new electricity supply would need to be brought onto the site at considerable cost. And some members of the working party were particularly concerned about the short timeline and adverse public perception because the sale was not being held on the open market, that best value might not be obtained or demonstrated, and that the council might be able to get a higher price for the land if the sale was made on the open market in an open and transparent way. And this concern was raised despite the working group's previously approved principle two. And for me, one of the uh, uh, main concerns was if the council did not hold an open market sale, it might possibly be open to legal challenge. And that is what we now know is not going to happen. Um, but I really didn't want to see the council placed in, in a difficult position. So as a result of these concerns, the motion was proposed and seconded. We've got a copy of that in the report, yeah? Um, and the motion was supported um, with one member voting against. I'd also add that the working, um, I've, I've said before, the working group is advisory and uh, doesn't, um, but those were the views expressed at that time. Uh, I would you. like to speak later. If yeah, okay, thank you. Um, just before we move on, um, what we may do actually, if we decide to do this, is is uh, just adjourn the meeting for a few minutes, just to enable us to set up the presentation that that's been referred to, so we can all have a look at it. But before we do that, I just have one one question, and um, I'm not sure this is going probably to Councillor Cox or maybe Mr. Richards, but we were con we were concerned about one party that potentially had an objection. Um, are there any others? that might or may not appear as a result of going to open tender. And if by limiting um, that exercise and moving towards the sale to the, to the UHD now, what would the, uh, you know, would we be exposing ourselves to any challenge at all? I think probably that's for Mr. Richardson's the session one on five holder. Thank you. 
Yeah, I don't think um, I can give you uh, such an open blanket assurance that you know a third party might take umbrage with the approach that we're going through and put in a challenge. I don't think I could ever give you um, that assurance probably around any issue because we are an open and democratic organisation subject to that third party scrutiny and um, um, public democracy. So um, on that, I can't give you the assurance, but what I can give you the assurances on is that we have um, consulted with the stakeholders, the stakeholders that were part of the BCP Future Places Sherot, I think. Um, and, you know, based on that engagement, we had those initial concerns expressed by one individual, one party as listed in the report. Um, and my understanding is that those assurances have now and issues have now been resolved. So I would be very surprised if the potential legal challenge that would have come from that party now materializes based on those assurances that we've received. Thanks, for instance. Uh, Councillor Dove. Um, thank you. Uh, just some clarification, please, um, just so that we are consistent in our methodology. If, for example, at the end of all of this, we approve or recommend, sorry, um, recommendation number two, will any other parties who have made a bid or express interest in this land also have the benefit of providing video presentations before the decision is made as to whom it is that will be awarded the uh, possibility of purchasing this land, please? Well, as far as the overview scrutiny uh, committee is concerned, probably not, uh, because you know we're having this meeting, and depending on what the recommendation will be, it'll go to cabinet. And like like um, the asset dispersal working group, this is an advisory uh, committee; it makes no decisions. Uh, it may be that this committee would wish to just pass on the recommendation in the paper that it, we recommend it's decided upon by cabinet, which is exactly what the recommendation says. We may equally lean one way or the other. Uh, it's up to us to decide how we want to do it. Um, but from uh, an overview and scrutiny perspective, no, this is, is the only shot that we'll have at this. Um, and uh, and having heard what Mr. Richin said, um, I don't think there's any reason why we can't proceed. Okay, Councillor Duff, thank you. Yeah, and just another point of clarification. So looking at the um, words that were used by the leader at the original um, previous meeting, I think on the 26th of February, 28th of February, it's quite clear what the um, fundamental purpose of the asset working group is. And she says, because fundamentally until the asset working group, which is a cross party group, decide whether there's due diligence and suggest that we should progress the sale. There is no sale. So I appreciate that at the moment we're calling it advisory, but I would say that their thoughts and their opinions very much do lead towards perhaps some of the outcomes and how we view that when judging our recommendations for the evening. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I understand that perspective. Uh, you know, why have a, an advisory committee if they make advice and then you actually disregard it? Um, but of course, it's not disregarded by the people necessarily making the decision. That isn't us. The decision will be made by cabinet and then subsequently by full council. Uh, and we've also had an explanation um, on why or from the chair of that advisory group as to why they went in the direction they did. And for some very good reasons and for the similar reasons that I had in just uh, holding back on the presentation this evening. But I think from the chair, we see that you know, the concerns that, that form that recommendation have now been alleviated. Uh, so um, I, I actually do not believe that, that uh, I, I believe we can move forward on this. Um, and as I said, the cabinet and then full council get an opportunity as well. Uh, and of course, any other part, the public also has an opportunity to make representations as well. And 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 make representations to cabinet and actually for full council, so you know it's it's not a closed off thing. Um, I think it's quite reasonable for us to make an assessment of of the paper as it stands. Um, so, any more? Yes, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I think um, the officer and the portfolio holder mentioned um, that letters of support. Um, I just want to clarify, a letter has been received which the leader 
um, gave us information on, but that letter only said, we will send the other letters. Now, I would be very remiss, I think, in any other context if I said, oh, that's all right then. But, you know, pop them along when you want to, because we cannot be secure in the not having seen those letters. However, I wouldn't let that put me off <laughs> because can I be, uh, be assuming that those letters will come prior to the cabinet decision? I mean, we're at a bit of a standstill, aren't we? We're told the letter will come. Oh, jolly good. But I don't think we can be secure. So I think that's a bit of a fly in the ointment here. Leader. So given that OU and Scrutiny are, are here to scrutinise and give their opinion and a recommendation, which you then go to Cabinet, that the fact that, so Adam very kindly said that in the report, the stakeholders are all named in the public report. And I can tell you that those stakeholders are all CC'd into that letter, into that saying, I can provide the letter. Now, you're absolutely right, they haven't arrived yet because it was sent on Thursday at 5.43 and it's now Tuesday. Now, if you want to, if you want to dance on the head of a pin over whether or not that potential legal challenge has di diminished or not, bearing in mind that the paper says that these people are now satisfied. I've just read you out an email from the, the main protagonist who actually says, we are happy for the sale to proceed and we fully support this transaction and we're going to send you some letters. Okay, and you could quite easily put a recommendation that says, subject to those letters being received prior to a decision being made at Cabinet, we think this is a great idea because if your whole concern is, are these people going to make a legal challenge? And none of them have come back and actually said, you don't represent me, we can only go based on the information we have. Now, you might decide to think that I'm talking rubbish, um, but bearing in mind it was sent to Sarah Good, Adam Richens, the people sat behind me, Graham has forwarded it on to me. That's your decision, isn't it? But I just think, we're, you know, we're, there's, a, there's a fabricated argument here. What if somebody else wants to make, uh, what if somebody else, the person who, that, that's actually written this letter wants to put a bid in? But they wanted to put a bid in, I'd have had a letter by now, wouldn't I? Because this has been in the public domain since the beginning of February. We've just been told that these all the people that were involved in the charrette have been notified that we've had this. The hospital have put this in the paper. It's a public letter. If somebody wanted to come up and say, please don't sell to the health hospital, we'd like to make you an alternative offer. They've had the last six weeks to do so. Nobody has sent an offer in that I am aware of. Uh, I'm Graham is online. Adam is here. Miles is here. Sarah is here. I'm not seeing anybody tell me they've received a counter offer. If somebody hasn't made a counter offer when they know that this is happening, then I think we probably have to assume that we're not facing a counter offer. But, you know, Cabinet will make a decision based upon the information in front of it, including any recommendation from this committee, but I, I think we're dancing on the head of a pin. Yeah. So, thank you, Leo. Of course, yeah, you know, there may just a minute, please. There are there, there may be organisations out there that aren't aware it's for sale, uh, but I agree with you. It's about time we got on and decided uh, started talking about the actual disposal of the land because we've been talking about process and procedure and nausea, and it's you know. So, I'm going to go to Councillor Cox first of all. He was before you, Councillor Devon. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I did just want to back up uh, what uh, Adam Richards was saying in terms of uh, the, um, you know, whether this is allowed or not. Uh, and and I won't pretend that this is my bit of research. This has come from uh, a certain a, a very uh, a good correspondent uh, with the council uh, by the name of Alex McKinstry, uh, who says that the case law has shown that, that this sale uh, to an exclusive party in line with independent variations is completely lawful reasonable uh, and a way that a council meets its best consideration duty. So, and that, and if you want the case law, it's Salford, uh, Salford Estates versus Salford City Council. So this is allowable. Uh, and, you know, in, in the light of any other alternative, I think this is this is a, a really good bet. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cox. Councillor Devon. I just want to assure the leader that I never think she's speaking rubbish, as she very well knows. Thank you, Lee. I wish I could give the same assurance, Leader, but that...
Okay. Who would like to see the presentation? Let me just ask members of the committee first of all. Is there anybody? How many of us would like to see the presentation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So how many have we got? Can we just count them again, please? Eight. Yeah, we, okay, we have a majority of the, of the committee. So if you wouldn't mind, we'll adjourn for five minutes, set up the presentation, and I think we'll be able to watch it on. If we uh, just adjourn, we'll figure out the best option. Yeah, okay. All right, how, how long do you think we're going to need? Just adjourn for five minutes. Just five minutes? Well, That's all right. Today. Thank you. Five minutes adjourn then.
Okay, welcome back members. Sorry about the technical things there. Um, so we've decided to allow uh, uh, UHD to give a presentation and Rob Whiteman, Chairman of the University Hospital Trust, is going to give the presentation and he'll be assisted by his colleagues uh, in a question and answer. It's just quite a, a long presentation, so I've asked them to just sort of be as, yeah. uh, as, uh, as quick as they can with it. But um, so. Please go ahead. We'll, we'll be as quick as we can, yeah. Chair. And indeed, Siobhan and Richard will cover some of the slides. I won't. I won't cover them all. You'll be okay. bored with the sound of my voice. Oh, um, sorry. So before you come on, I have made a commitment to another member before we start this. Uh, Councillor Beasley wanted to raise a couple of points before the presentation was given. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, and uh, I appreciate I'm filling a casual vacancy on this committee, but I have done a lot of background work. Uh, in order that I can fully understand the proposals and and act as part of the scrutiny process. Um, and so if we're now receiving a presentation, um, I'd like to be assured that we will have adequate time as an opportunity to ask questions uh, in order that we can ensure scrutiny of any statements made on behalf of the bidder. I think it'd be quite wrong uh, if we were not given that uh, to keep the balance. Uh, but of course, that in turn depends on a number of other things that might have been asked in questions uh, have we not been having the presentation. So it is to some it, to some extent one thing earlier than it should have been that otherwise. Um, and I'd also can really I just uh, answer that point first, if I may? You have my assurance that you'll have every opportunity to ask questions on the presentation, and uh, we will take as long as it takes, Councillor Beasley. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And so the, the second part of that is uh, I'm interested to know when we're going to start the scrutiny of the proposed sale this evening, because my understanding of the role of scrutiny in this process is to ensure as best we can best value and the public interest to safeguard the public interest uh, and to ensure probity as appropriate and transparency of the process, much more than uh, what is happening at the hospital and what their plans might be. It is about this land sale. And I, I, I really feel very strongly that that is where we need to be concentrating our time this evening. Uh, and the third and final thing is that um, I listened to Councillor Cox just now. Um, we don't know the circumstances. We haven't had the opportunity to research them uh, or to look at it any further. But I don't think this committee uh, in public gaze on the live stream needs to hear that we're taking legal advice from Mr McKinstry. I think that's quite wrong. Uh, and I think it's against, I think it's the whole, against the whole, I, I didn't interrupt uh, the leader of the council nor, nor Councillor Cox, so I'd be grateful if they didn't interrupt me. Um, but we've heard that Mr McKinstry has given advice then uh, about a, a legal case elsewhere in the country. Uh, I don't know the circumstances of that. Uh, so it's thrown in as though that it's directly relevant uh, to this particular case uh, and that the similarities uh, are very, very close to what we're considering tonight. I do not believe that that is, is correct. Uh, I'd like to hear some legal advice from our own council officers, uh, but if we're hearing it from Mr McKinstry, um, who was the name given, uh, I just think it is wrong that we're allowing that to stay on the tape. Thank you, Councillor Beasley. With regard to your second point, I agree with you. We're here to scrutinise it. And it was sort of in the back of my mind when I was earlier on when I was mentioning about, I thought there was sufficient information within the report as it stood to, for us to, to do that. But members seem to want to uh, listen to the presentation. So, you know, the view is that we, we ought to do that. Um, the third point, I agree with you entirely. Um, Mr. McKinstry, whilst he's a very able and capable individual, he doesn't represent the council's interests legally, and, and we don't take that as gospel. We can, of course, ask the monitoring officer, I think, who is online, uh, for advice on any legal matters. And if, if, if that's what you'd like to do, then let's do that. Um, but let's give that some consideration and let's watch the presentation, and we'll come back to that uh, after we've seen that. So, thank you. Mr. Rob Whiteman, Chairman of the University Hospitals. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Siobhan introduced herself earlier, councillors, and Richard Reno, uh, who joins us, is our Director of Transformation. If I can have the next slide, please, Adam. 
Uh, this is the Wessexfield site next to the Royal Bournemouth Hospital. You'll know that the NHS is investing hundreds of millions of pounds in the Royal Bournemouth site as a key uh, trauma centre and in, uh, accident and emergency centre for the whole area. The site matters a great deal to us, uh, therefore, bearing in mind the commitment that the NHS has made for investment in Royal Bournemouth. And this proposal, we believe, forms a win-win, both for you in your place-shaping role uh, and for us as the provider of acute services. If I can have the next slide, please, Adam. I promised you I'd go quick, Chair. Two things I'll draw from the slide. We have taken legal advice on as a board, we're, you know, we're a large public body with a budget of £780 million pounds a year. Uh, it's important for us that we act with property. Uh, and there's absolutely no question uh, in my mind, um, uh, the Cabinet member referred to the Salford City versus Salford Estates case from 2011. It's absolutely established in case law that public bodies have viaries, have legal permission to use the one stop public estate process and it can't be challenged legally. The challenge to it would be if the process were not properly followed. So if we hadn't, with each other, gone to an independent assessment made by a third party valuer, if we picked a figure out of the air, then the once public estate could be challenged legally. But as proven by the Salford case, uh, there is no legal challenge to it. And the, of course, the reason that that's been established by successive governments is because it saves public money if there is public usage of a site to add value to an area both in terms of health services but also the economy then actually it's better not to go through a procurement and better not to go through the fees of procurement and to alight on a better outcome for the citizen without bragging uh, um, some of you will know i am a national expert on local authority finance and public finance in my day job and there is simply no question of the illegality of the one public estate process and i tell you that as the chair of university hospitals dorset but i also tell you that based on the rest of my career uh, as, as well which i hope carries a little bit of weight the second thing um, i would say about why is this a win-win um, we have won a large amount of investment for the site uh, for example, the electrification of the site at 13 million uh, will cover the whole site, including Wessex Fields, but we can't do it twice. Unless we're able to secure the site, we will only be able to use public money for the electrification of our part of it, and we won't be able to do the electrification twice. If we can go ahead with the electrification, then as will be covered in the slides, we have plans for a science park or a medical school, we, have, we want key worker housing on the site, which is not dependent upon public grant, and we think we can proceed with fairly quickly. And what we are all about around the table, I hope, is working in partnership to make a strong economy for Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul, and indeed the whole area, and the creation of highly skilled jobs around the science park, whilst bringing workforce into Dorset in order that your residents have better health care because we can attract a better workforce in order to have those jobs is absolutely a win-win. And so on behalf of the board, uh, and before I hand over to Siobhan and Richard, I hope you feel the strength of passion that we have to bring some benefit to arable land that's been stuck for a very long time. Uh, you know, we're not talking about Park Lane Mayfair here in terms of a long history of trying to do something with it. This land has been stuck for a long time. It's former arable land next to our site. And by God, we're going to do something exciting with it. And I think that's a win-win as much for you as it is for us. Siobhan. Richard, I think thank you. Good. Thank you. I'm just going to add briefly to that. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Richard. Uh, and, and in terms of the first aspect around jobs and economic growth, um, we know that life sciences is a, is a large industry for the UK. It's very little in Dorset, um, but you, you fundamentally need some building blocks. One is a large teaching hospital uh, and education, and particularly medical education, is the, is the linchpin of that. Uh, the national strategy is to double the number of medical trainees in the southwest. Dorset is the largest county without any medical school. Uh, we are well placed uh, for that. But you need to co-locate those 
uh, because most of that medical training will be in health in, in actual healthcare. So that would be 500 uh, uh, um, medical uh, tr uh, undergraduates, which will supplement the ones we already have. That then unlocks more research and development, which again uh, generates jobs. So that that is the unique thing we've got for for this side. And um, if we have the second slide, please. Um, the housing aspect we've touched on, no uh, private developer is going to see a uh, commercial return on housing, which is at, at key work housing rates. But we've got every uh, motivation for this, not only because it means we can recruit and retain staff, and we are uh, across Dorset struggling to retain staff in the, in the NHS, um, but we've also got a partner who's already developed this model and has uh, key worker housing uh, in Yeovil and in uh, uh, Dorchester. So it's a proven scheme and uh, it's highly attractive modern housing. People could, our staff can then walk to work um, and they are a not for profit uh, operator. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then on the environmental factors, the, uh, if we just skip over that one, then environmental factors. Um, the really exciting aspect for us is that we have, and as uh, some members of this uh, committee know, uh, uh, the interest in geothermal, uh, we've done further work on the opportunity and we're extremely well placed for that, but you do need a critical mass. And so what we'll be doing is looking to develop geothermal heating, uh, which is very common on the continent, uh, uh, to, to implement it here. That would allow us to heat not just the hospital, but the surrounding area. And um, that's a long term uh, uh, net zero energy source. You can only do that if you've got the uh, uh, oversight of the entire local site with a large anchor institution. If we know that we're heating those key work homes and the hospital, it gives us the critical mass that would be much more difficult with a separate uh, commercial landowner. Uh, there are other environmental benefits around transport, uh, as well as say, key work experience, walk to work. Um, best value, I think we've touched on, so I won't, I won't cover that. That's about proving uh, the legality. Uh, thank you. And then the last point around health is that we do work very closely with Friends uh, of the Elderly, which is the charity in the middle of the site. Uh, and we do have uh, I'm signing with them about them developing their strategy as well. So it'd be complementary because they are in desperate need of being able to rebuild their uh, uh, their estate. Um, and also that if we have a thriving research uh, opportunity uh, locally, it also means that people get the latest treatments uh, because the research uh, allows that to happen. Uh, and we know that key worker housing improves lives and that's in, in bottom corner there is the evidence around better staff health from uh, good quality housing. We are losing staff who come to this area uh, and then rapidly move to the other parts of the country because the, the wages are the same, but the house prices are cheaper. So it's really critical for us. Uh, and then my final slide was just to say uh, thank you, is that we, we do know that from, from the uh, report uh, and, and also from actual what's happened elsewhere in, in the West sort of larger area is that um, storage is the most economical commercial. So if we do go uh, open market, then there is a market for storage. That's Lock and Store, who have already bought a site next to next to the hospital. And therefore, we 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 know that those opportunities for uh, key worker housing, not for profit, would be lost. So um, I'm just going to hand over Siobhan for the final comments. Uh, last two slides. Um, I suppose I've, I've been chief exec at University Hospitals Dorset for the last uh, just under two years. Uh, it's amazing. Where's that time gone? I have to say that um, to, to the point made about public interest, this is just such a once in a lifetime opportunity between BCP and health as partners to really develop uh, what will be a real community, uh, a local community driven uh, whole project. And we want to very much do this in partnership. The site plan is developed by BCP and Future Spaces. We've used that places. Um, we're really, really working in partnership in a very different way to how UHD probably originally operated. People probably know I'm a nurse. Uh, it's really important to me that what we do is in the best interest of the community, as well as our patients and our staff. And our final slide. Um, 
we talked about a track record of delivery and some of the concerns about, you know, how soon can we get spades in the ground? One thing that I have been so impressed by is how we have delivered across UHD, both in Poole and at the Bournemouth site. It is quite incredible to see what we have managed to deliver whilst also delivering care and reducing waiting times. And I just uh, say we have got some very skilled people who are incredibly passionate about this and want to really make this happen. So thank you for enabling us to talk to you tonight. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Uh, before the presentation is put away, do any members have any uh, questions on any of the slides or Kevin Tarling? Yeah, you mentioned obviously a science park and development of that. Um, just on uh, developing uh, with partners, um, uh, this, uh, farmer, science tech uh, business, is it your intention that you retain title over the land though or, or, or buildings? I'm very sorry. It's all right. It's all um, the best model for us would be a JV where we retain title. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Richard, but we, I, we haven't. We have no intention of of transferring the site. We would want to keep it. Um, I mean, we haven't done the level of detail of work that has happened. Uh, future phase to work on. We want to look at the detail of work done today, and. Um, but our model has always been to that. But as as, as our chair will know, the accounting rules in the NHS are, are laborious. So we would need to work really closely with those partners. But the principle is, uh, you know, we, look, we're a long term institutional body. So we're going to take that long term approach. Without pouring you to tears, um, you'll know that NHS capital is capped in a way that local authority capital is. So we would have to take something else out of the NHS capital programme in order to proceed with something else. So the most typical model in those circumstances is a JV model where you invest in the site for a period of time. It's a bit like PFI without the without the unattractive side um, where you invest in the site and on and you keep rights over the site and also it reverts for you at the end of, to the end of the JV. And we sort of have to do that. Uh, for as long as there's a cap on local, regional and NHS expenditure, and it's what all NHS trusts have to do because of the accounting trend. Thank you very much. And uh, having worked on a hospital PFI before, yeah, I can agree. Uh, don't, don't go down. Thank you. OK, thank you. So if we close the presentation down, I don't see anybody else wanted to. Oh, sorry. Uh, Catch them off over. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if I could ask you about um, transport because um, my ward is right next to this, to this, and uh, a lot of my residents have people parking and causing them not to be able to even maybe get into their homes when they um, return home themselves. Um, and so I just want to be really assured that there's going to be a really solid transport plan, and that I'm worried also that this road will encourage people to think that that opens it up again, you know, that we're almost encouraging car use again because they, um, they'll they see that and think that that's something more viable again. I'll, I'll let Richard, because he's absolutely immersed in the detail of our transport strategy. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we've got a uh, really significant programme to, to reduce car usage. We Everyone's on a permit, all members of staff, so we restrict the permits for, for those. We're investing heavily in bus subsidies uh, as well and increasing the cycle lanes around the site. Um, we're also looking at a um, uh, uh, the, the, any road access to be restricted to, to those permit holders so it wouldn't become uh, effectively a ramp run or encouraging of, of, of that. In terms of the um, uh, a, 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 any parking in, in your ward, um, we, we really happy to work with with local councillors. We are working on schemes to try and um, shift parking uh, on uh, car users onto buses. And we've got some more things that will be coming out next month or so that I'll be very happy to share in terms of incentives and ways to try to reduce that. Um, and with the future places um, uh, master plan for the site that we, 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 we're uh, uh, getting to understand, there is a multi-storey car park on there as well. So we would be uh, trying to reduce any of that 
dispersal of parking. So it is restricted because it will be at the edge of the site. Um, there will still be a bit of a walk, so it's still encouraged cycling, bike, which will be right to the front door of the hospital uh, uh, and walking and bus. So that we are trying to get the balance because we accept that not everyone's going to be able to get to the hospital uh, uh, by public transport. So we've got we've always got to get a balance mix there. But uh, we think that the the um, detail of that will obviously come out for the planning uh, and planning information and transport standards. So there'll be a lot more scrutiny there as well. Um, could local councillors have some input into that? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to close the presentation down now. Sorry? Have we? Did we? Who was that? Oh, Councillor Rice, are you, are you with us? I. I Hi, yes, I am. I did put my hand up, but it was about Sorry, transport. Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't see it. I beg your pardon. Go on, Councillor Rice. It was mostly about transport, and I've had some answers to it. So that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Thanks. So, Councillor Beasley? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think some of the questions I've got are probably for the session itself afterwards, because they will be questions probably more to officers than they are to officials from the uh, from the hospital, uh, I'm grateful to uh, Mr. Whiteman for his um, uh, for his help uh, with uh, the advice that we were given through a third party. Uh, unsurprisingly, I am familiar with that, but I'm sure that the rest of the committee uh, will have uh, various degrees of understanding of it. And I think it's important that a meeting such as this uh, has uniform understanding. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical, um, and so hence the reason that I was challenging it. Uh, quite right to do. Um, that doesn't actually get us off the hook when we come to red book valuation, etc. And we'll no doubt deal with that presently. Um, I'm interested, though, in two other things, Chairman. Uh, the first is uh, we have seen uh, in the papers uh, and we've heard uh, from uh, Mr. Whiteman uh, and indeed uh, from Mr. Renault uh, about the, the great plans that the hospital has and how they will be afforded by uh, actually delaying other works that have been funded, is, I think, my understanding. So I, I'm therefore intrigued as to uh, what probity has been uh, used to determine that the proposals are affordable within a suitable time frame, or are they aspirations? So that, that to me, is really important that we understand why we're, why this process is being proposed. Um, and I, I haven't seen anything that gives me uh, any comfort about that, Chairman. Uh, so we've heard it again this evening, but again, I haven't actually seen anything that, in terms of evidence, supports the ability to do it. Property of NHS decision making or the property of council no, decision making? The, well, you might want to make light of it, but I don't. No, I'm not making uh, light. I genuinely didn't understand. Well, somebody found your comment making. amusing, so I assume. If, if you would like me to comment on the probity of the NHS so, decision, so what I'm, what I, I'm, I gladly what I'm will, trying to... Beasley, you're, with respect, your your question inferred that you were questioning NHS probity, which is why I'll gladly comment on that as chair of the board. No, my, my... if you would like me to, I wasn't making light of it. Can can uh, can I just ask that you address any comments or questions for the chair, please? And don't speak unless you're invited to by me. Thank you. Councillor Beasley, if you want to yes, Chairman, rephrase I think, that question. Well, I, I think it I think it uh, demands uh, some response. Um, and, and I would expect in these circumstances where uh, it is proposed that there is a preferred bidder, which isn't isn't necessarily my view of the subject, uh, as to what uh, evidence has been uh, provided uh, of the availability of capital to our council officers that we can understand that the assurances being given are deliverable. That, that's what my question is fundamentally about. And I think the public interest would demand that that was the case, Chairman. That's, that, for me, is a fundamental question. Thank you, Councillor Beans. Yeah, of course, I'm aware that uh, heads of terms agreement has already been drawn up and not something that I believe anyone would enter into lightly. Uh, Mr. Richards, I'm going to ask you if you would like to comment on that, because the question is more directed at the council rather than the NHS here. 
Thank you, Chair. I look to my colleagues um, for support, but generally, I'd say that as you as you referenced, you know, heads of terms um, have been um, set out and agreed um, in principle between the two parties, subject to cabinet and council authorization, and through that process, assurances have been attained um, from Union University Hospital um, that they can fund the commitments under those heads of terms. Yes, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my third question uh, is regard to uh, what Mr. Renault was explaining to us about the geothermal and district heating scheme. Uh, and I I'm intrigued as to uh, whether or not and how far advanced those discussions are, because Mr. Renault will re re recall that uh, I and officers at the time, I think it's the thick end of 10 years ago, brought a very similar scheme to the hospital in which the hospital was absolutely key. It probably represented 40% or so of the usage. So we've got Little Van Leisure, the office developments, the court, um, the supermarket and the hotel. And, and the proposal was somewhat similar to that. The sticking point was um, that at the time the hospital was just about to enter into a, a different contract, so it couldn't provide that. Um, and of course, there are significant costs in putting it forward. And I just wondered how far advanced that was, Chairman, because it, it could be very, very good news and it's, it's taken a long time to come. Uh, obviously, I'm very supportive of it because I was then, but, but I just wondered whether it was reality or whether it was aspiration. Is it reality or an aspiration? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, what what's fundamentally changed it is it is a really exciting proposal is that uh, obviously energy prices have changed second that uh, our 25 year contract on our incinerator will be coming to an end which supplies all of our hot water which was the fundamental difference so within three years and secondly we've been looking at net zero development for the site uh, so there's a lot more buildings to heat all of those come together plus the um nhs nationally is looking to support hospitals because they are major major energy users um, in, in geothermal and we are in one of the best locations in the country for this so there's national interest support for this that said you know it's always a hard graph to get these things going and over the line but we will put that work in because we're really committed to doing this so i can't guarantee it but i can say these stars are aligning in a way that is really positive and and i am absolutely aware that we had discussions you know about this many years ago and and it is exciting those things have changed that make it now viable and we are uh, in early stage discussions with companies uh, that have that developed this. It's very common on the continent, uh, less so in the UK. So we've obviously got to work through the national NHS procurement, and we're in a group uh, with with other trusts that are looking at technology, which is more by the government. So thank you. Okay, but so have we finished now with the uh, the presentation? I think we have. It's been taken down. Um, okay. Uh, Let's, let's focus on the paper a little bit and the, the recommendation that's before us. And, you know, the, as I said earlier on, the recommendations that can recommend that the council, so the and there are the two options are there. Um, members may wish to, uh, you know, make an alternative uh, recommendation or otherwise. Uh, Councillor Kavanagh. Yeah, I just want to point you to paragraph 22 of the report, which was the wording that was agreed by the uh, Asset Disposal Working Group. Uh, if Cabinet is so minded to dispose of the site, that it does so by way of an open process, marketing the site on the open market for a two to three month period of time, with the expectation that the highest offer being the preferred preference of disposal. In addition, the group felt strongly that the aspiration of the site as per the local plan be demonstrated by the accepted bidder. That's why I think the overview and scrutiny committee should support, Chair, and I'm prepared to move it. Um, my, uh, I was at the, uh, I was at the meeting and I, I feel that like Councillor Moore's uh, explanation of what happened was entirely fair and that the minutes are entirely fair. Um, but I don't think much has changed with respect to Chair, that the, the threat or the possibility of 
a legal challenge by one particular party. Um, I'm taking the word of the leader that that may have disappeared. Uh, and I don't believe there was any uh, debate at that meeting. I don't recall any debate at that meeting about whether or not what the council was proposing to do in terms of the public the transfer between public bodies was it was in any way illegal. There was no suggestion that it was. Um, so it may be right, Chair, uh, but is it right? You know, it may be illegal, but is it right? Uh, and that that's the essence of the discussion I believe we had at the asset disposal working group. And I don't believe anything has changed. Um, if we are to serve the public interest, then it's absolutely essential that transparency is maintained. And the only way you can guarantee that is by selling this piece of land on the open market. Um, now, there are lots of reasons uh, in the background as to why that might not be possible for the hospital, not least of which uh, av av available, uh, being the money being uh, available or not, as the case may be. Um, but whatever the reasons are, Chair, the only way we can guarantee that we are getting best value for that piece of land is to put it for sale on the open market. And that was the essence, I believe, of the discussion that we had at that meeting. And for me, nothing has changed. Uh, so so I, I, um, I, I don't believe that the, the two options are two options. This, this was the strong uh, recommendation from the Asset Disposal Working Group, because we, it was felt that um, that was that was the best value. The, the other thing I think it's also worth saying is is that there was never any question about what the university was, what the hospital was planning to do with the site. Indeed, I, I recall council were saying there wasn't any any argument about what was uh, what the, what hospital were proposing to do with the site. You know, the, what what was envisaged was was welcome. The issue is. Is this local authority getting the best value of money for probably one of the most prime bits of land in the whole conurbation? That's the issue. And the only way we can test that is by going onto the open market and, and, and asking. And I, I don't believe it's relevant, Chair, with, with respect to everybody. I don't believe it's relevant for anybody to say that, oh, because there's been six weeks, anybody who wanted to make an offer could. That's not an open process, Chair, with respect. If, if you go out to the market saying we want to sell this piece of land, then you don't know who's going to come forward and, and uh, make a bid for it. You know, we, we discussed at the meeting the, the history of it in the sense that there had been some soft market testing previously, and there were a number of expressions of interest in that piece of land. So it is perfectly possible that we could get the, the same value, if not more, for that land than, than we are apparently uh, uh, obliged to give the hospital as part of those heads of terms. So, so for me, Chair, um, I'm, I, I haven't changed my view about those recommendations that are in paragraph 22, and I believe that is something which the overview and scrutiny board should be uh, expressing to Cabinet when he meets next week. Thank you. So, just, just for clarity, are you making a formal uh, move, are you? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm happy to move that, Chair. And, and can you just outline what that move is? I, I, I get the gist of it, but I want, I want the words. Yes, I, I, I will move that. As a board, we, we accept the wording as proposed from the Asset Disposal Working Group uh, as set out in paragraph 22. I mean, I'm happy to read it if you want me to read it, Chair, but it's in bold in paragraph 22. And Councillor Dove wishes to second that. Okay. So we will now have a, a debate on that move. And I think that's why you're holding your hand up, Councillor Tarling. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and one of my day jobs previously uh, was involved in a £4 billion asset disposal programme as a portfolio manager on a uh, public body that was disposing to other public bodies. And many, many parcels of land were disposed of to um, local authorities, Homes England, and actually uh, other government departments. So uh, it, it does happen, um, and that is uh, permitted. And quite often that was well, and 
when you were disposing of a site to Homes England, the key valuation is did it have planning permission for, for houses, in which case the, the, the value of that land would go up by uh, tenfold uh, uh, over and above some of the sites that the RAF were disposing of, which are pretty worthless because they're out in the middle of nowhere. But the key thing I want to point out is that um, these valuations that we get, um, RICS Red Book, I, I'm not a member of the RICS, but I work very closely with a lot of members of the RICS. Um, value isn't just pounds. Um, value is also social value. Uh, and what we do for our um, local authority, yes, we could sell it as, as the... Uh, as we've we've heard here, that uh, the the biggest return would be from uh, a, a storage facility. I won't name them, but uh, um, there's loads of things we could do with the land, or we could uh, want for it, um, it once we dispose of it, or sorry, prior to disposing it. But once we've disposed of it, we don't have a say on on what's happening. What we have here is is a is a body, a public body, which is which is to um, purchase this land at the red book valuation. Um, um, but we're not just disposing of the land and saying, great, we want the money, that's the end of it. We are investing um, by allowing this disposal, and the value is, is more than the pounds that we get in our bank account. It's the, it's the influx of, uh, of technology, it's jobs, it, it's, it's as, as laid out in our local plan for the Wessex Fields, uh, or forthcoming local plan, it's that social value that, that we're adding. And you know, the, the NHS was formed post the war for the benefit of the people. Um, and, and I'm a firm believer in the NHS, not one trust necessarily. Uh, and I think to, to do away with, uh, and I, I find it quite, quite strange that uh, that uh, uh, the councillor is, 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 is moving this motion purely on financial cost, um, when, you know, I like to consider myself a bit of a socialist when it comes to this. Uh, and 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 for the betterment of, of the people, not just for the betterment of BCP's bank balance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tarling. Councillor Deadman and then Councillor. Thank, thank, thank you, Chairman. I'm still in the questioning mode, although I hear what Councillor Canavan says, but I think that the general disposals consent thing of 2003 was mentioned. Is that not right? Which means that a council may transfer property at less than its market value without permission from the SOS, provided that the purpose for which the land is transferred is likely to contribute to the promotion or improvement of the economic, social or environmental well-being of the area. Now, is that what you were saying? I, I'm so sorry. I only know you as Rob. So I think Rob. That, <laughs> Councillor Dutton, I think that's, I that's, a, that's a question for Mr. Richards. Yes, there. thank you, Mr. Richards. But well, that's, well, that's what was mentioned. Well, can I just come in and just clarify? You know, there is no suggestion that we are going to transfer this land between the council and hospital for less than market, you know, with less value. With respect, I didn't say that. I said oh, that, that is the act. Okay, sorry. Uh, I apologise, but you know, I just want to clarify that actually the intention here is to transfer the asset, the land between the two parties in line with the best value requirements based on a RICS Red Book valuation. Okay. Uh, members, well, can I, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chairman, but can I just say that it would have been jolly handy to have had this clarified prior to the gentleman over there who I don't want to keep referring to as, OK, Mr Whiteman, I did know about that from the County Council, but I hadn't connected it with this. And I think that should have been brought forward to us at all the meetings we've had on it. And I think that should be put into the mix now. If anybody needs it explaining, I'll read it out. Thank you, Councillor Devon. Uh, just one thing I would like to say, members, is that, you know, the Asset Dispensal Group Working Group did have the meeting uh, and they came to a view. Um, but of course, their uh, recommendation uh, things have moved on a bit and we should still have an open mind on this. So, you know, we're not constrained to what recommendations were made by that group. We can make our own. This is this, this advisory group stands on its own. It's up to us to decide how we feel about things based on what we're hearing tonight from everybody, uh, presentations and everything that we've heard um, and the advice from officers. So, I, I think, you know, we, we just need to remain open minded, I think. Um, and this is a very, obviously, a very, very important uh, issue for everybody. 
so let's you know it's a serious serious thing um so with that um was it captain moore thank you thank you chair um yeah i yeah i i obviously i chaired that uh, group but since then i have done quite a bit more research and also the um uh, the report that's uh before us um for the oms group i think contains uh more of detailed or more explicit information than, than was actually available and which I admit um, I didn't fully understand or appreciate at the time. And um, I, I really want to address the, the, the major points um, now. Um, paragraph 43 in this report confirms a RIC's Red Book valuation has been obtained to establish the sum agreed with UHD represents the best consideration that can be reasonably obtained Paragraph 44 of the report also confirms there's no question of subsidy to consider as the sale price is at market value. Um, paragraph 15 um, in the report that a sale to UHD will be in line with one public estate principles. This is an approach promoted by the local government association and the cabinet office to encourage public bodies to collaborate where possible and to adopt a shared vision for the use of public sector assets with the aim of unlocking public land to create economic growth, new homes and jobs, and delivering more integrated customer focused services. And from further research, I find that a sale to another public sector organization at Red Book Valuation is the approved way for organizations such as councils to ensure they don't waste public money and this would apply to both sides of the sale in this case. Um, they don't waste public money on expensive legal fees and push the price up by private developers bidding and then perhaps possibly land banking, resulting in years of inaction at the site or negotiating out public benefits for commercial gain, which is actually one of my biggest concerns. I don't want to say that uh, to see this uh, site stay idle um, and, uh, and land banked when it could be developed now by UHD for medical health technology research, plus building much needed hospital key worker housing. And that is something that I totally support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Councillor Trent. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I disagree with the um, proposal that's seconded um, because um, getting the best mark price for the site isn't necessarily the best achievement that you have got sort of locally if i was a developer looking at this site i might be looking at it and think, oh there's there's a decent sized holiday park there you know we might be able to go along that line or something we just got to get around the local plan and so on whereas what is um proposed in the direct sale is something which is actually beneficial to the area it makes it makes perfect sense it's it's quite a balanced proposal and um that would be put at risk if it was just sold to the highest bidder so i think that we've got to be very cautious about um you know everything goes goes to the highest bidder i think land banking was mentioned that's that's one problem that we've got with a lot of sites around um, this area is that, you know, there is there is lots of land in the bank that's not been developed. So my my, my inclination is actually to go for the um, recommendation one, which is to um, sell it to a. An organisation that we know what is in mind and. Um, as to say, I would, I would warn against um, going going for the highest bidder. Thank you, Councillor Trent. Councillor Salmon, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I only wanted to echo uh, points that yourself and and Sandra made about um, the. Uh, I'm also on the working group, um, and and at the time we had different information. We talked about that quite a lot already this evening. Uh, the group, I think, took a, a cautious approach to the information that was in front of it at the time um, and chose to make that recommendation based on that. We have things have moved on. We have more information, as Sandra said, in the report. I also wanted to highlight that in that recommendation that we made, 
the last sentence, the group felt strongly that the aspiration of the site as per the local plan be demonstrated by the accepted bidder. And that was something that myself and others raised that what we do with that site does matter. It isn't just about how much money we get. We're not an estate agent, we're a local authority. And the use, the use of that land and the, the social value of that land is extremely important to, to, to most of us, to all of us, I would hope. Thank you. Thank you, Anyone else? Okay. Oh, Councillor Beasley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I have one or two questions, but could I deal with them in, in some sort of order and get responses first? Because the, my first question is around the Red Book valuation. Uh, and we heard earlier uh, that uh, it might be the case that a further Red Book uh, valuation uh, might be obtained. I don't, I don't quite understand why, how, or indeed, more importantly, what the criteria of that would be, uh, because uh, any Red Book valuation uh, does depend uh, on the brief itself. Um, and if the brief has changed, then clearly other things will have changed in the process. Um, but what is clear to me from what I've read is that um, th there is a pretty hefty discount involved here because uh, of the building of the road. Not something that anybody has mentioned. Uh, and I go back to uh, why originally Bournemouth Council uh, obtained, purchased this site from the Cooper Dean estate. There were one or perhaps two people, apart from myself, around this table who will remember that, but there isn't anybody else. Uh, and it was Bournemouth Council that purchased this after protracted uh, negotiations. Um, it uh, took some risk, uh, perhaps, in... Um, uh, finding the capital resource to do that, uh, but it decided it was in the best interest of all concerned to do that. And one of the key drivers, of course, uh, was the issue of the road uh, and the development of the Great Separated Junction. It was also about working in partnership uh, with the then hospital uh, over certain elements of the land, but it was very much a council owned uh, asset. Um, and the joint venture that was proposed. Uh, later within that context is something that uh, I think probably Mr. Renault will remember it maybe vaguely now because it was a long time ago. Um, but uh, he will recall the discussions that we had, uh, which uh, were very much in the public interest. What we didn't have discussions about, because it wouldn't have satisfied the reason for purchasing the land in the first place, uh, was to sell it to the hospital. That that was that was not the issue that was there. It was about trying to derive the very best value possible out of the land collectively, uh, and again, in the public interest, which is what we're here, Chairman, to examine uh, this evening. So my first question is around this Red Book valuation uh, and why uh, it has been seen to be uh, a changing circumstance to require a second one. Uh, and it's also uh, around um, who and how uh, any road infrastructure or indeed any other infrastructure is going to be uh, financed because it would seem to me that will have a major impact on whatever valuation that is put onto the land. Uh, whereas obviously if it was out in the, uh, out in the public uh, domain uh, in terms of uh, trying to get offers, that, may be a that might well be a different uh, circumstance. So I think we need answers to that. Uh, and I'd, I'd ask it to be in the context of paragraph 41 uh, of the report, just so that we're all quite clear uh, as to what it is that we're being told and the reasons for it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cole. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, uh, having once been accused of, of taking, taking legal advice from uh, Alex McKinstry, which I deny, um, I would like, I'd like to say that we did take legal advice from the monitor officer uh, about this very subject, uh, and it was her advice that we take two red book valuations in these, in these circumstances, and that is what we've asked for. Uh, so I do take uh, legal advice, and, and that's what we've asked for. Um, in, term, in terms of the valuation, the valuation is not at a discount, the valuation is, is at the red book value, as, as the land is. Um, so. uh, yeah, I... I... Could I just ask, Mr. Richards, the report does say 
that if it went to an open market tender, a second red book valuation would be required. So I think the, the question is is legitimate because it does say that in the report. And the, what, what is the reason for that? It was it was the link, it was monitoring officer Janie that suggested it. So I said, yeah, I think you should ask her. Is the uh, monitoring officer online? Hello, Chair. Yeah. Did yeah. you hear the question? Um, yes, Jamie? I did. Yeah. Um, so the principle that I have two red book valuations is to demonstrate independence and its best evidence towards achieving best value. So rather than just rely on one, um, which may have some sort of bias, for example, you have two completely independent red book valuations and you look at the outcomes and to give yourself assurance that you are achieving best value. Thank so you, you don't so just rely on one. It's, so the second one just gives you that that further additional assurance. So, so does that mean that the uh, a second valuation would have to be carried out in order to before it was sold to the hospital as well, or is this just if it goes out? To no, I think um, my understanding is the leader raised that uh, clarified that issue at the beginning, um, said that um, the second one is being obtained. So it's in the process. I think um, the leader referenced that right at the beginning of the meeting, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. I was obviously asleep at that point. I beg your pardon, Leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monash Officer. Does that answer that part of the question, Councillor? Uh, well, it does. It does to the extent that the monitoring officer has uh, given us an explanation as to why there is a second. Uh, but it does come back to what the criteria are around that valuation being made in the first place. And I, I listened carefully to Councillor Cox a moment ago. Um, and um, uh, I wasn't actually, uh, I, I think you've misinterpreted what I said earlier, but I think we better leave Mr McKinstry behind us now. Uh, I don't think we have any difference there, actually. We're coming at it from different sides of the same uh, discussion. Um, but I think what, when I say uh, at a hefty discount, Chairman, and I'm trying desperately not to stray into territory that should be below the line, uh, what I'm talking about is what the obligations are on the purchaser. And that makes a substantial difference to whatever valuation is put onto the land. Uh, and it might make it affordable, whereas without that, it wouldn't be affordable to the hospital. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to get to, because that will determine to a large extent for us here today uh, whether or not that is best value. And I'm trying to get to some sort of transparency. Now, I won't see the brief, and I doubt that you will either, that is given uh, for those valuations. But it might be quite interesting to speculate that they may not fully reflect where we are in that process around affordability for the preferred purchaser and how that is going to be achieved, how that circle is going to be squared in terms of getting it down from what would be perhaps an open market value. And much depends. Uh, on uh, the the land planning use that's applied to it. You know, we heard earlier uh, that uh, perhaps storage uh, would be a higher value. Uh, I would perhaps dispute that it would be higher value than employment land, which is its designated use at the moment. Uh, and I'm just, I'm concerned that we are having clarity here so that we can have transparency as a result. And I'm I'm not satisfied by that from what I've heard. Thank you. I, I mean, I the, the the issue of the road is a key one in terms of the, the purchase price, and I thought that that was quite explained very clearly in the report about what the arrangement. The only little caveat was that it was subject to a purchase of a small piece of land, which I didn't quite understand because I didn't quite understand what that small piece of land was, um, but. I understand where you're coming from because in an open market, the arrangement may be completely different. And depending on what anyone else wants to purchase the land for, it could be have a huge impact on the value of the land. I understand that. Um, but um, I guess we come back to the points that Councillor Darling made about social value, et cetera, and the, the view of officers and also the direction that we're steered in, in terms of strategic 
policy on regeneration, etc. Um, this is probably one for the leader, and the leader's holding a hand up, so let's hear from that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm aware that Councillor Rice is also indicating that, but I hope that she might have a response to what I'm about to say, and that is that, you know, clearly, uh, Councillor Beasley is correct in saying, you know, when you're asked to value something, you're asked to value something based upon a set of circumstances. That, that land at the moment has no road access. It also has no electricity, has no services. So if we were to sell that land on the public open market, where would they get their electricity, their water and their road from? So therefore you can only sell it um, either, there's three choices. There's the council does all the work and pays all the money to build the road at our expense, borrowing the money that we don't have um, and putting in electricity, water and other services. Um, we've already committed that we do not want a grade separated junction. Uh, that's not coming back. And therefore, you know, that isn't going to give a, a, an external developer what they want. It's also in the local plan for very specific things which this fulfills and which somebody else, as, as Councillor Trent said, might not. So the choice is either we pay for all of that, which we're not going to do. We sell it to somebody who is agreeing as part of that sale to build the road provide the electricity and water from their existing provision on site um, or we sell it to somebody else who has to fund all of that who therefore will want the same sort of price because they're going to have to provide that and in fact it'll probably end up with a negative value because they aren't going to be able to access the electricity uh, other than from us or from the hospital. They're not going to be able to access the road unless it's from the access road for the hospital that we've just agreed to do directly with the hospital. So I'm, I'm struggling to understand what we would end up with other than a white elephant of somebody buying it saying, oh goodness me, I'm going to give you another X amount of money for it, sit on it and then realise, oh my goodness, I can't do anything with this land. So I, I just... So I, I'm of the opinion that we need to be thinking not only of the triple bottom line, you know, this is about money, environmental impact, social impact, wider economic impact. So it's actually a quadruple bottom line, um, but also a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. So that, that's what I've said before. I just think, you know, we we can't second guess where an alternative purchaser might think they're going to get their electricity, their water and their road access from. And I, I just think, you know, we can actually have something built you know, three years from now. We can have nurses walking to work um, rather than looking at an empty space and still wondering if we might get a little bit more money. That feels a bit crazy. Thank you, Leader. Before I invite uh, uh, Weidman to, to speak, um, I hear what you say, but what you're what you're uh, summarising are the the reasons for making the decisions that you wish it, the, the cabinet's made. We do have other developments where the developer does put new roads in. They do provide electricity. They do provide care homes. They do provide employment sites, and they pay for it. And they pay for it from the sales of the property that they that they develop. This is no different, actually. The real difference here is one of uh, scale and it's one of social importance and value to the community and all the things that we've been hearing about. So I, I hear what you say, but I don't accept accept it. Um, but uh, please. Begin. Well, it's, it's good of you, Chair, to um, let me say something else. Thank you. Um, we've respected as a board the red book value given by the independent um, valuer which took into account what we want to do with the site and to some extent probably inflated it. And we respect that and we haven't argued that the value should be less because we will make greater development use of the site than anybody else. Uh, and so I, I, I just want to balance the argument a little bit because I, I, I wouldn't want to create the impression that we are buying this site at a discount because I don't believe that to be true. I think the Red Book valuation has taken into account what we want to do with the site, uh, including the jobs and the housing, and the fact that we will also provide the, electric, the electric, electrical infrastructure. Uh, my personal view, 
was that I expected it to come in a little lower, if I'm honest. But uh, and I think that's a reasonable, but as your partner, and we are all on the same side here, and I appreciate the difficulty, you know, for members and you want to see value for money, but we are all on the same side of wanting good health and economic prosperity for the area. And my honest opinion and our board was we decided to respect the value that was given by the Red Book valuation. But I I had expected it, just to balance the argument, Jet, I'd expected it to come in a bit lower. But we respected it because that was the process we agreed with the council. Thank you. Councillor Rice, please. Good evening. Uh, yes, thank can't you. Hear you. Can't hear you, Biz. Ah, uh, no, you can't hear me. <laughs> Can you still not hear me? Uh, maybe. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? No. The issues on our end. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, we're just having some problems for a, for a minute with the uh, audio on the system. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Can you hear me? Whilst we're playing around with it, can you hear can you, me? Can you still? Can you hear, uh, Captain Beasley? And will this be recorded? Because I, I, forgive me, I should have. I didn't finish our discussion, Councillor Beasley. And this is still live. Yeah. Still okay. Live. Okay. Well, whilst we're sorting that out, can I come back to you, Councillor Beasley? Because I apologise for. Thank, thank we you. We haven't. Sam. You haven't finished. I know. I'm sorry if I've got a number of questions, but that's quite um, all right. But, we are here to act in the public interest, and yes. if we don't, then nobody else will, because there isn't anybody else. Uh, and I, I feel incumbent to be asking questions. Some of them may be awkward, some of them may be uncomfortable, but they have to be asked, because otherwise we're not doing our job properly. I'm sure you agree with that, Chairman. Um, so one of the issues that I, I raised just now was about the designated uh, land use. Uh, and if we deviate from employment land use, we risk um, other other issues, do we not? Uh, not the least of which, of course, would be uh, a public inquiry uh, into why we have deviated from that uh, in the first place. So I think there's been a lack of clarity about designated land use. Um, and as soon as we went into changing it and it became storage and now we're talking about it back to employment which is what its use should be we're now talking about housing um now none of this is to be critical of the hospital and its aspirations that's not what we're here for chairman we're here to scrutinize this process for disposing of this land asset mm -hmm. nothing more nothing less and that's why i'm consigning my comments just to that part of the agenda so i think I think there is a great deal of uncertainty, Chairman, about being able to deliver some of these things for reasons which we haven't yet got to. So that that's those that's those points. I think uh, I think my next one uh, is is something which um, I, I I'm a little bit concerned that the decision is almost already made, uh, and that whatever this committee says will not actually materially change anything. Um, and I, I would like confirmation from the officers as to whether um, any um, uh, money has already been deposited with the council uh, over this uh, land sale. Uh, and if so, uh, whether that is commensurate with uh, the Red Book valuation. In other words, uh, has a decision already been made? Has, that, has money been accepted by the council um, uh, in, order to, in order to basically, I suppose, um, have a provisional completion. That's a little bit of a hybrid because it doesn't exist. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's essentially a provisional completion uh, based on getting the authority of cabinet and council. Um, because if that's the case, then I don't think that is in the realms of transparency. So perhaps, Chairman, we could have an answer to that question. Yeah, thank you very I much. I do have other Mr. questions as well, Chairman. Mr. Richards. Chair, thank you. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there has been no physical transfer of cash between the two organisations at this stage. Thank you. Please go on, Councillor Beasley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
if if that is if that is the case, and I accept what Mr. Richin says, obviously, um, then um, uh, then uh, we aren't quite as advanced as I thought perhaps we might have been. Um, I, I wonder whether uh, any account has been taken uh, of the int intellectual property, uh, which obviously has been accumulated for the site uh, as a result of the work done by Future Places. That has a value. Uh, it, it has a value not least because it's been paid for effectively by the council um, and I would like to be satisfied that that has been taken into account uh, in uh, the proposed purchase price out of the valuation because that is something which we can only uh, get any value from to somebody who purchases the site. It's of no use or value to anybody else. I think yeah, it's an interesting question because, I, you know, with the future places I haven't worked on it for such a long time, obviously an investment uh, in time and energy by them. And I think we've heard mentioned of the future places work earlier on. Maybe I can address this one to Mr. Richens again, I'm afraid. It, it, you know, it, is there an IP issue or purchase issue associated with it? Or is the council accounted for that? I suppose. The assumption is that actually there is value to that work we've done by BCP Future Places. And I don't think I'm in a position um, as I sit in front of this committee to advise as to whether there is value associated to that. That's something that we need to 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 reflect on. But I will open up to Sarah and to Mars to see if they've had anything more specific they can add to that response. Um, I'm afraid I'd have to find it well to, to dig back through. Um, we'd obviously have to get some legal advice about whether the hospital could rely on any information because it will have been purchased by a third party anyway, so I'd have to get some legal advice. I, I think we've been probably talking at a higher level here, as in principle, as the as the work carried out by future places been accommodated in the pricing arrangement, I think, or the valuation. I think that's where you're coming from, isn't it, Captain Please. That's absolutely right, sir. I think we're at a, a much broader level than looking at detail. So, so I think the answer is probably the answer is no, you know, in the sense that, you know, there is with regards to the, the mythology taken with regards to the value, the Red Book's valuation, I don't think it's made any specific adjustment for the value of the work previously undertaken by BCP Future Places Limited. I, I guess a follow on question from that is should it have done? Clearly that's a, a, a question for debate, yeah, and something for consideration. Okay, Captain Beasley, do you want to? Uh, thank you, on? thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'm also, I'm also questioning uh, within the whole scheme of things what the situation is with the retired nurses' home, uh, because that has have implications on value. Uh, we haven't heard anything about it. Um, I know a lot of the history of it. I know the toing and froing of it, uh, but I don't know what the current situation is, nor indeed what the proposal is and how that might affect land value. Is this one for you? Uh, I, I mean, I, as I understood it, the stand to be advised, but I don't think either party owns that land. No, I thought the report excluded that part of land. Uh, it does, Chairman. It, yeah, it isn't in the ownership at all. But, but uh, the important aspect of that is that the value of the land uh, could be influenced by. Uh, whether or not the retired nurses' home stays in situ or whether it moves and the availability of that land or otherwise. That was a consideration uh, when the land was first purchased uh, by the former Bournemouth Council. Is there anybody who would like to comment on that? You lead, are you commenting on that? I'd like to comment on that and something else the Council of Easy said. Firstly, you know, we're looking here at whether or not uh, we go with a direct sale to the hospital or an open market sale. And therefore, whether or not the retired nurse's home decides they want to move and get involved with a, you know, a, a discussion is, is sort of irrelevant for either. It isn't part of this site. I think I recall one of the people from the hospital talking about their ambitions to work with them, that they want to move, they want to have a new facility, they want to therefore be the, you know, uh, the the living, um, uh, I don't want to use, um, I don't want to be quoted as saying guinea pigs or something, but, you know, people who are actually experiencing the Meditech stuff for the future. But I, I need to refer back because 
Councillor Beasley said about, oh, you know, this is about employment land, this is about homes. I'm looking here at the Wessex Field Business Plan Master Plan Design Reports highlights, which I was given in June 2019 when I was leader of the council before, that was prepared, and I quote, was prepared um, for Bournemouth Borough Council in conjunction with Bournemouth University and the hospital as it was then, and clearly shows the brief for the Wessex Master Plan was prepared by Bournemouth Council in conjunction with Bournemouth University and the Clinical Commissioning Group. A key driver was to create an integrated health and wellbeing environment, da 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 da. And within the map I am looking at is a great section of hospital key worker housing. It's always been part of the proposal and many people will have seen the really futuristic incredible designs that we presented probably to scrutiny back in 2019 before we opened up to that public scrutiny at the bridge um, where we had these really wonderful modern ideas of how the place might look with spheres and the Francis Crick Institute so I'm just a bit confused about why Councillor Beasley isn't aware of that, bearing in mind he was leader of Bournemouth Council, and so he would have been party to creating this in the first place. So there was always an ambition that ancillary housing to support the hospital and health was part of this, and that the primary use of the site was around jobs, but there was always going to be some housing there, and, and the money was given by the LEP for that purpose. So nothing has changed. This is just realising the ambition that Councillor Beasley had when he was leader, that I had when I was leader previously, that, you know, had to go on the back burner because there's not enough money and now there's the opportunity to deliver. So, you know, I need to, to make that clear because this isn't coming out of nowhere. Councillor Beasley, do you want to? Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to hear that the, council, that the leader of the council is confused by that, Chairman. Um, all I can all I can add uh, is that other circumstances appear to have changed since that document. I'm well aware of the document. I was party to it. In fact, probably signed it off. Um, and um, uh, had I had notice, I would probably have been able to um, find said document because I have an awful lot of paperwork uh, of our previous administration. So my point here, Chairman, is that other circumstances that have changed, uh, which includes uh, the decision to not proceed with the great separated junction has a massive impact, a massive impact on a whole host of other things, not least of which is viability of doing some of this work, some of this development in partnership uh, with, with the hospital, and also, of course, around uh, key worker housing, which was going to be a separate part of that integral uh, redevelopment of the, of the wider site. Um, in fact, very much promoted by me. That doesn't mean, though, that uh, there wouldn't be requirement uh, to get the necessary consents uh, around land use uh, designation uh, to enable that to happen. The problem is, Chairman, all of this is being done in a rush, uh, and therefore there can't be any certainty about those issues, whereas we had a very measured approach over a much longer period of time. Uh, Chairman, if you'd allow me to have my final question, uh, which is around the Dorset LEP funding uh, and, um, and and how that came how that came about. The the original site, of course, was purchased by Bournemouth Council from its own resources, uh, be they cash in the bank or be they borrowings. Uh, later, uh, as as one of the representatives of the council um, on the Dorset LEP. Uh, since its uh, since its founding, uh, I made I, I made representation uh, to try and get some more funding, uh, and I believe we ended up with north of five million pounds uh, around how this site was going to be developed. Um, we haven't heard very much about that, so I'm not I'm not familiar with where we are at the moment on it. But that Dorset LEP funding is, of course, essentially government funding for a particular purpose. Um, and uh, I, I hope that we are complying with that purpose, because otherwise it's quite likely there'll be some clause, back, clause in there around clawback. Uh, and I just wanted to be, I just want to be mindful and cited on that 
so that we're not caught out later on uh, and then accused of not asking the right questions at this overview and scrutiny meeting. Thank you, Councillor Vesey. Mr. Richards, can you comment on the left? I think it's in the report, it is covered in the report, but if you could just. Yeah, I suppose you know, my reflection, Chair, is the, the statement that we heard really at the beginning, in the sense that I thought we had a statement from the LEP that gave their full support and endorsement to this process. Um, I might have misunderstood, though, but that was my understanding. Okay. Still That's don't done. understand whether or not we're going to be liable to pay that money back, so I just wondered if we could actually have an answer to that, please. Okay, that's a, a more direct question. It... I've heard no mention of a potential clawback, but I can't help you beyond that. Obviously, the LEP has made the statement of support and they haven't asked for any consideration in that regard. So uh, I don't think there is any risk of a clawback, but it's certainly never been mentioned. I, is I, it to you, Richard? I, no. I think I think the question is for you, Mr. Richards, you know, it, if you're content, then I think we would be content. So. Chair, yeah, I think the the answer is you know, clearly we've got some statements um, from the net with regards to their position. Um, we have asked them the direct question the council has posed. Um, we are waiting for confirmation, but best indication we've got is that that will be a positive response, that there will be no clawback. But I couldn't give you 100% assurance until we've had a formal response. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brown. Just provide one factual piece of information. The, the initial grant to, to Bournemouth Council was for 500 jobs on the site. Uh, the NHS already delivered 200 in pathology lab. So the most progress that's been made, obviously, has been through the NHS. We'd, we'd expect easily to be able to achieve that 500 without the uh, um, without the uh, uh, junction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, just a minute. Councillor Rice, first of all. OK, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, Thank you. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll just read out what I popped in the chat there. Um, so I just briefly wanted to say that uh, the sale of the hospital to the working group, uh, sorry, that I supported the sale of the to the hospital when I was in the working group, and my thoughts remain the same now. Um, I support all the social, environmental, and economic benefits of the hospital developing the land, um, as it discussed extensively. Um, my main concerns remain around transportation to and from the site, and all of the surrounding sites. Um, and I would suggest that any of the road building that is agreed um, is reconsidered um, given the hospital's commitment to net zero and walking and cycling and active travel and buses um, to ensure that the road is built to encourage that form of transportation um, and that it is a pleasant place to live for the key worker housing and it's safe for children and that crucially it does not encourage through traffic in the area. Um, another point that I wanted to, to make is that there has been a huge shift in the public's perception and their expectation for development of land now since Councillor Beasley first uh, made the the initiation to sort of purchase the land, um, that there is global warming now and we need to be thinking differently about how we create jobs for local people and that people can access these jobs uh, through active travel, walking, e-cycling, e-scooting, buses um, and not locking in carbon emissions uh, and that the, this grade separated junction is completely unnecessary um, and that we should be looking at the transportation that is extensive around that area. I could not believe it the first time I went to that area and had to cycle across, um, I think, possibly 12 lanes of traffic. Um, so there is plenty of space for transportation. We just need to think about moving people around a little bit more efficiently. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're going to um, cut to Tarling and Councillor Slade and Councillor Salmonick. Now you're finished. 
um, and that will be it then. Uh, okay, so it'll be, uh, and bear in mind, we are talking now about the proposal. Okay, uh, that's, that's been tabled. So once uh, uh, Captain Tarling has had his tuppence worth, then we're going to go to the vote. Okay. I'll try to keep it to tuppence. Oh, so we've got um, some of it's regarding the uh, question about intellectual property. And as I mentioned before, uh, I worked as a portfolio manager uh, with defence estates uh, and writing business cases. Um, intellectual property, it's not unusual for a, a, a vendor to procure design services, surveys, um, valuations as part of the process. Uh, and within that will be some intellectual property. Um, it, as long as it's for the benefit of the, the vendor, it is perfectly um, acceptable to um, transfer intellectual property rights for the benefit of that project only. Um, and that is very common practice in, in, in both the public and private sector to do that. So, um, uh, so future places uh, is no longer their IP rights have transferred to the council in wholly. Uh, and as such, it, as this is for the benefit of the council, um, we we won't have any problems with intellectual property rights because it is for the benefit of this project. If the if the um, um, hospital trust wanted to then take these plans and use them for a completely different project, that would then be a breach of the IP. But it's for the benefit of this project. Therefore, there's no no IP issues. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Captain Tarling. Okay, I think we we've talked this one through now. Just, just members, just hold on a minute. I just want to clarify a point before we go to the vote. Um, as the cabinet, uh, the proposal that you've tabled it, it reflects the, the statement that was made in the disposals um, committee. Um, when I'm looking at this particular report, there are basically uh, the re one recommendation that the, count, the cabinet decide one or the other. Option two is effectively the same as what the disposals group uh, came up with. We could stick to your wording exactly to that, or we could, you know, go with the option two that as, as written on this report. It doesn't really, just, just to make life a little bit easier. Um, have you got a view on that? Uh, yes, I do have a view, and I think we should stick with option two. That, that was, I think, in, in, it's there, in my view, because that was that was the recommendation of the Asset Disposal Working Group. Uh, so that's why it's in there, and that's what I, what I believe, Chair, we should um, stick to. Um, uh, if I might just say a couple of things, though, in kind of right of reply, nobody is questioning what the hospital wants to do. Nobody is questioning that it has a social value. Nobody's questioning that. The, the issue is, can somebody else deliver what we want to deliver, i.e. something that delivers what's in the local plan, uh, that, that provides employment, that provides an economic value, but gives the council a better return. And that's why that last sentence is in there. That's the last sentence in that paragraph that Councillor Salmon referred to, that's why it's in there, because of the discussion that we had at the Asset Disposal Working Group, that uh, it's not just a question of price, there is a value to that land, there is a social value to that land, and that's why there, there is that caveat in that particular paragraph, Chair. So it's not just you know, selling it to the highest bidder, it's about selling it for the right reasons at the right price. Uh, and, and that's what I thought you were seeking to do. Um, I'm, I'm a bit bemused by the by the discussion about future places because I, I thought the whole purpose of bringing it in house was, um, you know, that that we were um, uh, bringing with it all of that, all of that, uh, whatever value that had in, in in terms of whatever it was they'd done. But that that's from the story. But the only one final point I want to make is about land banking, Chair. I've been around a bit, 
and and land banking is not a phenomena of the pri just the private sector. The public sector also land banks land. Let's let's not mistake about that. So it's, it's not you know it's not just the devil of the private sector that land bank stuff. It's not. So I think we should just uh, we just dismiss that. The object of the exercise is to get something built. Uh, that benefits the community, but has the best possible value. And it's not a question, in my view, Chair, of um, a, a bird in the hand, is, is, you know, what, whatever that expression is. That, that's not the point. The point, in my view, is about trying to secure the best possible outcome for the sale of that land that delivers what we want it to deliver in terms of uh, employment and economic prosperity, but at the same time uh, delivers for the... For the uh, Council tax payers of Bournemouth, uh, you know, a, a reasonable return on on the money that was expended on it all those years ago. I don't believe that's that's an unreasonable request, but, and I also believe it's it's possible uh, to do that by doing that through an open market process. That's me finished, Chair. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cabinet. Okay, so we're going to go to the vote now, and um, I will ask Democratic. Well, I think Lindsay's going to do it to read out the proposal that's been made and seconded by um that's the dove yes we yes please go on then if you want to Thank you. I've waited patiently for all the questions to be asked. So there's a few misconceptions that have been um, said this evening. Um, firstly, there was a comment about the only way you can get electricity will be through either the hospital or through us, namely BCP. So there's that question that remains that BCP would withhold access to electricity to, if another party was to purchase that land. The second one was the road and there can't be access um, because it will be going well, it will be on the road that the hospital are building. And again, that's incorrect. The planning permission was particularly um, changed and altered so that the free road would be the priority and that the hospital's road is on that bit of land that they have purchased. And I think that facts are important and we shouldn't be misconstruing the facts just so that we can get a particular outcome. One question that I haven't really had a satisfactory response to this evening is around the transfer of the funds. And what I'm trying to understand, therefore, is whether the funds have left UHD. And I held... Um, right. So I think... Finish my question. So can we just try and understand whether or not it's been transferred into account either partly or effectively in partnership with BCP and UHD or in an escrow account? No, Just it hasn't. There, there's been no transfer of any form known to any form of accounting. I can give you an assurance. Yeah. And the other question that we need to talk about, I think, is because we haven't, we've talked about land banking and holiday parks and goodness knows what, but actually we haven't stuck to the actual facts of the uh, papers and, and of the planning permissions that went straight up to the Secretary of State for, um, I think you were sat on the planning board at the time when that came forward to us, is will there be a change of land use required in order for UHD to develop their scheme? Uh, okay, um, and I have I just one more question that, after that. Okay, yeah. let's, let's, I'm going to go to the portfolio holder, I think, on this one. The question, the question is, would, would, would I believe it's for jobs and therefore I do not believe it needs a change of use. Thank you. And very lastly, I know we've had um, legal advice given to us, and that's one thing that I really wanted to just try and clarify because this came across my desk um, some time ago. But I was just, um, again, asked, Janie Berry, if that's okay for her advice. The Fraud Act 2006, Section 1, Subsection 1, talks about those who are in positions of responsibility on behalf of other persons, and that can be the council, the chief executive, on behalf of the residents. And, and they're basically their primary role is because we've talked about the social value and we should set aside the financial interests, but that actually means or, or sort of puts an onus of responsibility to safeguard the financial interests of another person and intend by the means of that use 
to either call to loss to that other person, namely either council for the residents because they're safeguarding and, and guardianship of that land. And in doing that, they can do that either directly as a post act or on a mission with the double discounting that's going on with this piece of land, um, because firstly, it's um, being discounted um, for the road and the expense of that road, but then also being um, valued as storage land as opposed to the employment site. I'm just wondering what the uh, monitoring officer has done to make sure that the council or any persons working on behalf of the council aren't at risk of that piece of legislation, please. It's, I'm, I'm going to say, Councillor Dove, that, that that question is for the Chief Financial Officer. I Chair, believe. Chair, can I take a clarification? Is the council accusing council officers of potential fraud? Now I've asked you, what work have you done to prevent the risk of that? because it's we have a legal duty to safeguard i'm really sorry that you find this funny i find it despicable that you find it funny i think this is a really serious matter i've not accused the officers of anything and i'm really sorry that's how it's come across but we do really have to be aware of the financial fiduciary responsibility we have as a council well i'm just asking what work has been done to ensure that we don't put anyone at council risk itself, that, that, you know the, the, what you're asking is it's account are the council officers doing their job which they do every day and i think you should be summing up now and actually you've introduced a whole load of new stuff and so i'm actually going to move on now and move to the vote so uh for all those in favor oh sorry, sorry. i'm just going to summarize the the, the, the move that's been tabled i'm just going to summarize so that there's clarity around the proposal um, so what's been proposed is that this board advises cabinet that the board supports the view formed by the working group as outlined at paragraph 22 of the report, which states if cabinet is so minded to dispose of the site, then it does so by way of an open process, marketing the site on the open market for a two to three month period of time with the expectation that the highest office offer being the preferred preference of disposal. In addition, the group felt strongly that the aspiration of the site as per the local plan be demonstrated by the accepted bidder. Thank you. So members, all those in favour of that uh, motion, would you like to indicate now? Three, four. Um, so, I vote those, supported, please. Yeah, yes, of course. And those against members? Okay, so that's nine against. So members, that now leaves us. Um, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Abstentions. I beg your pardon. You, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Councillor, okay, Councillor Salmon, you wanted to come in. Oh. I did. I I wanted to ask um, if I could formally propose uh, that we that this. Um, that this board recommends option one. Second is councillors um, Leslie Dedman has seconded that. Okay. Um, do we want any discussion on this, members? Does anybody have anything they wish to add to the debate? No. Okay. All right. We'll go to that. Um, to that motion? Is that a clear yeah. one? Oh. Yeah. Okay, so our recommendation is that the cabinet uh, approve option one to this report. Okay, all those in favour? Eight. Against? Two. Two. Against any abstentions? One abstention. That's okay, member, that's carried then. Thank you. Oh, that's hard work. Yes, and and thank you for coming this evening and um, giving us uh, the brief and. Uh, so let's see what the cabinet has to say <laughs> and then full council. <laughs> I wish you well. Thank you. And uh, Thank we'll you. just give you a, a moment to, to leave and then we'll carry on with the rest of the agenda. Thank you.
Chair, do you need us to stay or have you completed that idea? No, no, please. Unless you'd like to stay and see what it is we've got in store for you. Because we've got some... Oh, fine, I'd rather have a surprise. We have, we have some... Well, I'm constantly surprised by what's going on in the cabinet, so I, I'd like to get my own back. So. But OK, we... And we, we love having oh, you at well, cabinet. We, we need I'll to, see we you need next to, week. Yes. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, members, uh, our forward plan and uh, we've had we've had lots of discussions about we've had workshops up the evening about this and we could talk of what forward plan to death. We've probably done it. Um, so I hope you've all seen the letter that went round, which which really. Which we're going to come on to in a minute, but it did actually suggest a way forward, our forward plan working at, towards the next 12 months. But the immediate concern is what we have on our work plan as currently agreed. And I'd like to just quickly go through that to make a couple of changes to that, if you, if you don't mind, um, because some events have overtaken us. Um, um, it's been to that in there. Complaints is in there somewhere. Crime and disorder, that's in there. Virgin policy in there. The kick a bit. Fiber thing. Um, there's no dates on it. Some of those I think need to come. Yes. I'll, yeah. I'll address that in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there are there are there are basically mo most of the items that are in the four plan at some stage we think should stay in there. It's a question of scheduling them, and we'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. There is a one thing on here that I think should come off immediately, and that's the shared prosperity fund and investment plan. Because that's, I think that, that related to the uh, improvements to the pier and some of the other things um, uh, along the coast, which the allocation has already been made. Uh, so I think that's just the historic one that I think needs needs to come off. Um, external consultancy contracts. Um, I'm not sure of the history on that one, but it wasn't something that came up in our work planning meetings and. The, and so I think that one should should come off. Um, the uh, gigabit neutral host operator that will change because there's a paper coming forward on the chain changing the, that proposal. So I think that that is probably now outdated. So I think that should come off. And it, it, with your agreement, if, if everybody's happy, I'm, I'm, yeah. we can take, we'll take it off. Okay, thank you. So that then brings us to um, the. Um, the letter that was uh, sent round uh, by Claire Johnson earlier uh, last week, I think it was, which outlined the end result of all those work planning meetings. And we, 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 if you remember, we had the discussion with the, um, the Centre for Oakley yeah. and Scrutiny, yeah. uh, Governor and Scrutiny, and uh, we came up with some very broad objectives. And then we got all the all the ideas and suggestions from members. And we sort of matched that in with those basic headings. And, uh, and now we've come up with a work plan that reflects those suggestions. And I think we've pretty much included just about everything that was suggested by members, uh, pretty much. Do you, I think Lindsay's going to just take us through that, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, members, I'm not intending to go through the items on that draft work plan that's been circulated to you because they are as stated and some of them have... Um, reference to links higher up where councillors have completed uh, a fuller scope on a form. Um, but just to be clear on what we're suggesting happens currently at Appendix B of the published agenda, you have your current work plan, which is fairly scant now. The proposal um, is to take table three within the circulated um, email to you, which is very much in draft, and to formalise that as your ongoing work plan. You have discussed around a number of those topics a number of times, but what you haven't yet done is come to an agreement or plotted those into any particular dates. So we're trying to sort of move to that point now where we have something on paper. Um, a caveat is that there are a number of items in red text which still require further scoping. So. Um, 
we need to go away and do some scoping on those to make sure that the, the scope is um, appropriate. But these are the broad headings that we're suggesting, um, and they're very much drawn from those councillor suggestions that you um, shared through the workshops. Um, just one one further point, um, you did discuss in your workshops the suggestion of briefings so that you could stay ahead of pre-decision scrutiny um, to talk about what might be coming on stream, uh, you know, a number of months ahead, not just before cabinet, but many months ahead. Um, obviously, there would need to be a discussion around what what needs to be put into those briefings, but I would like to have direction from the committee today on whether you would like a programme of briefings to go in your calendars and on what frequency or not. So that would be really helpful to have that direction. And, and just one further point, I think, on uh, what, the, what the chairman was discussing, which is on Appendix B to the forward plan report, the only other legacy item that I think needs tidying up on there is you have a complaints procedure working group listed. We didn't discuss that as a potential working group within the um, work planning sessions. There is something around complaints procedure that's lifted, listed on the draft work plan. So I'd suggest that also be lifted out of the legacy program. OK, so, so that's my suggestion is. Is um, asset out. Just just a word on the complaints issue. Uh, the transformation program uh, recognises that the complaints made by members of the public is fragmented. It goes into different departments, comes in at the council in lots of different ways. Um, some of it goes to customer services, others doesn't. And and this is recognised in the transformation program where they're trying to to bring all of that information together in one place. And would it be great if you could actually get some data to support some of the things that you know we need to be aware of and we can put corrective actions in place or whatever. Um, so we are. I'm a member of the transformation working group, as as is the vice chair. So it's a thing that we're we're monitoring to make sure that these things are included in that in that program. And so that's why I, I don't I think it would be probably premature for us to set up a working group looking at the complaints issue when it's being dealt with under the transformation program. Um, just a, just a word on I'll come back to you in a second, Councillor Darling. Uh, the the briefings. Um, I'm not particularly in favour of scheduling briefings at this point. I think if we need one, then we'll get one. But we have a monthly meeting anyway, and we have, you know, we, we have a lot of work already. You know, we're pretty, you know, to throw in additional, and we may even have additional uh, special overview scrutiny meetings from time to time, you know, to deal with, with things that arise for emergencies or whatever. Um, so I think I, I, I'd like to be more flexible about briefings, and if we feel that we need one, then we'll schedule one in at the time, uh, rather than just actually have firm dates for it. That would be my opinion anyway. Anybody like to comment on that? Happy with that? My Councillor Tully. Yeah, thank you. You've actually answered sort of part, partly both the questions. I was going Firstly, about um, space in the agenda, that although we've got a plan, it's, uh, you know, I was at Eisenhower, said plans are thingy but yeah planning's something and then plans are useless something like that um that we that we do retain space and ability to throw in and you've mentioned there about an additional uh, exceptional osbs if we need them and that's fine as long as we're aware of that uh, and regarding briefly briefings yes i agree with you formalized um in the diary briefing is probably a bit too onerous but but i i would say you know we we have teams we have the ability to put on there um, something like a, a plan on a page or, or one page report briefings so actually have a written briefing rather than a, a meeting um, that's available uh, and so, certainly nothing more than a, a one page um, report which could then direct you to other other areas or other reports or other officers uh, statements that uh, are useful because I, I mean I don't want to read 150 pages each and yeah, have enough to planning OSB and uh, the other bits and pieces, I think uh, just one page. This is what we're talking about, and these are the issues. If you want to do some background research, on it. thank you. Just a word about the uh, what we haven't scheduled that far ahead is cat is uh, uh, pre decision scrutiny, uh, essentially cabinet work. Uh, we, we have looked ahead and 
come up with some ideas about the next couple of meetings. But beyond that, we haven't because we don't. The, the actual cabinet forward plan is not really that well. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit thin, and um, so that's purposefully been left like that. And also, you're absolutely right. We need to remain flexible because it might be that we don't have a uh, cabinet report which is scrutinised. Maybe there's something in the proactive scrutiny that we could move into those particular slots. So we don't have to, you know, because we've decided to fix it into three different, you know, reactive, proactive, and um, cabinet. We don't have to do it like that. We can do it whatever way we want, and we'll we'll flex it as we need to. I think that's probably the way to do it. Professor Trent. Thank you, Chair. Um... One item on the agenda, which I think is um, this is probably not close enough. Yeah, um, which I think is worth thinking about again is the item about business improvement districts. It talks about the board to determine if it wishes for these items to remain on its work plan. I think, particularly recently, business improvement districts have become an important part of the delivery of things within the whole BCP area. And I think actually having some kind of system of maybe an annual report from the um, the bids would be a useful way forward because it could alert us to a few things that perhaps we need to be thinking about it. And obviously the same thing would go into the um, tourism bid as well, you know, to actually get feedback from these essential partners of what we do. And I think it could be something that... Yeah. We we do have it scheduled. We have the bids scheduled in the formal plan. Yeah, yeah it's in there. Well, it's you know two under date date dates to be allocated, but it says yeah. you know do we wish yeah for this to continue? It, what date have we got it in? For? June. July. It's on. It's on. So not just not the the draft that we're talking about that circulated last week. It's included in the July session. It is in there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, fine. That but you're true. absolutely right. It is important. That's why it's there. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, oh Councillor Rice. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Councillor Rice. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the so camera was sure. only focused on Councillor Salmon, and I couldn't see the chair responding. I am. Um, uh, what did I want to say? I wanted to say about uh, the. Oh, sorry, I've just moved my documents. Um, 13th of May, uh, you've got one hour for pool park cabinet report, one hour for seafront strategy, and one hour for regen priorities. Um, I was just uh, confused um, by pool park requiring a whole hour. Um, and then in the following meeting, we've got a transport up transport plan update and that itself was an hour so the whole of transportation for the whole of BCP uh, was taking the same amount of time possibly as I assume the pool park cabinet report is simply about one uh, one change um, in in the park with regards to transport so I just felt that that was an odd thing to have in there uh, the pool park cabinet report um, and if people feel strongly about it that that should be uh, people can just represent go go to cabinet because there isn't much to i don't know it just, just seemed odd to have that as a whole um slot i do recall uh, a very special overview of scrutiny session which discussed the previous tro or etro for a little bridge somewhere uh well yeah went on and and it went on. It went on for hours, Councillor Rice. But it, it didn't. Cre this is what we, as an overview and scrutiny board, I thought we were agreed that we want to get more involved at decisions earlier on, and that it's really not that useful to be discussing yeah. the details of something like this. That, um, if you want to make strong opinions on a tiny detail, some something like this, then go to cabinet. But in terms of overview and scrutiny, like overview of the whole of transport network, yes. Um, it, let me just put this so in I just context, thought it was uh, Councillor Rice, just because it says an hour, that's that's because we've just broadly sectored it to give us three different potential agenda items. One for pre-decision scrutiny, one for reactive scrutiny, and, and one for, um, what's the other one? Proactive scrutiny it doesn't have to be like that we may actually decide 
to do two hours on one subject and 10 minutes on another. You know, it, it, we've, it's just this sort of broad structure to give us something for planning purposes. It doesn't mean because it says it's an hour is an hour. It's, it's, it's just it's just to give us an idea of what what we're going to be doing. Um, can I just come back on that? Sorry, I can't hear you. I'll assume that I can. Speak. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, oh, sorry, so just, also I was interested just in... Just a second, no, oh. Councillor Dove, could you just turn your mic off a minute, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead. Also, Thank you. I was also interested in um, the sequencing. Uh, so whether the, re the sort of proactive stuff could come before the pre-cabinet decisions. Um, because obviously one of the difficulties in chairing um, is that things can, people feel passionately about it and it could be quite difficult to bring a conversation to a stop. So I'm worried that in the overall structure that we've got at the moment, I think 50% of hours are allocated. Obviously that is a, as you've just said, flexibility, but 50% of hours are allocated to pre-cabinet discussion and they're all first in the meeting. So I'm a bit concerned that that will move much more towards sort of taking out the majority of our time. I can I can assure we can change the sequence in which we deal with things. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, we can do that. And, you know, if you, there is a view on any particular way we structured an agenda, then please say so, you know, at the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's whatever the committee wants to do. That's fine. So just to practically in terms of that, um, uh, I don't know, I'm just thinking normally we would agree things to come to a meeting, but we wouldn't see the order until it's published, at which point it would be difficult to change. Uh, so I suppose you're wanting us to, if we have any particular views, then to say that at the time it's being added to the agenda. Not necessarily, as long as you give me a call and tell me what your wishes are before the agenda it is, you know, it is in the gift of the uh, chair. It's one of those owner's responsibilities I carry. Uh, so uh, you, if you have a reason for putting something on first, in fact, I, I do this anyway, because sometimes people can't actually come to a meeting on time. They, they come in later. So we talk the agenda around to suit particular needs. So, yeah, please, uh, Democratic Services is going to... I'll try and be brief, but there was a point I wanted to make, and I just want to respond to Councillor Rice. Um, I, th I think it is really helpful to have the views of the committee when you're talking about your work plan each month. If you've got views on your order, particular things, or parts of information you want, um, it would be really helpful for, for those to be outlined um, in the committee meeting because the work plan is owned by you as a committee and the chair takes on a delegated role to move it forward between meetings. So please do take up you know, that opportunity to give as much input as you can, particularly as we're changing to a new sort of format, um, reflect and give input. That would be really helpful for us in between meetings. And the other point that I was remiss in not saying earlier was that those items in red um, that require further scoping, I should put a heavy caveat on that. We do need to, you know, cite them to officers. And it's very important to make sure that we're not duplicating work elsewhere in the council and that the timing is appropriate to be meaningful. So we need to cite them with officers next and um, exec members and make sure that your work programme is going to actually add some value. So um, we, what we want to do now here is to get your collective view. Are you happy to sign up this broad outline? It can be tweaked, but broadly, are you happy? That's what we're asking for. Is there any dissent? Members, uh, no, dis no dissent. No dissent. It's, okay. it's not dissent. I just wanted to come in and, and support of what Councillor Rice was saying about yep. um, order and not always leading with pre cabinet stuff because I think she's got a very valid point about that taking up and potentially taking up a lot of time and all our, our energy as well. The last items at risk of being the one we're all a bit <laughs> flagging by the time we get to. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so just can can that be very firmly sort of um, put forward in this meeting as can we just reorder some of those topics? Yes, you can. If that's what so absolutely, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That's a dead man. Yes, can I just say that I feel that the cabinet um, stuff is important and that's partly what we're here for. 
So, I, uh, although fine, put it anywhere. You can always change the agenda on the day. But my point is that we are here to scrutinise things before they go to Cabinet so that they don't go to Cabinet and we don't have a... Yeah, I, I do agree with that, Councillor Devon, because we should not undervalue the work we do in scrutinising the decisions of the Cabinet. That's what we're here for. We do it on behalf of the public. We expect them to be held to account. And, and, and if that means that at the end of the day, we scrutinise it, we challenge it, we test it, but if that means we come up with no changes or recommendations, we will have done our job because absolutely that is our job. So whilst we want to do things for ourselves as well, but that we mustn't forget the importance of doing pre-cabinet scrutiny. And I think we recognise when the other committees were established that we were likely to do more on, on the board, likely to do more pre-decision scrutiny than the other committees. I think that's recognised. But... But having said that, you know, we will be flexible. You know, I, I certainly, if somebody wants to turn the order around, I, I don't I don't have any objections to that. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, I did have one more comment. Yeah, please go on. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, it was just with regards to the briefings. Um, I appreciate having um, something put into the calendar um, so that I can get my other work commitments around it and I know to keep it free. Whereas if I'm given a briefing at the last sort of a week or two in advance, it could be a bit more difficult to make sure that I'm... So I'd prefer to have something in my diary and then it be cancelled um, than, uh, than it not to be there, if you know what I mean. So that was just my preference. Thank you. Okay, all, I mean, all I'll say is that, we, you know, if we think that we need a brief, that we will agree. And if we have problems about dates, we'll discuss it at the time. I think that's the answer to that. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I know what you think, <laughs> Councillor. Uh, Just a quickie. Um, may I ask? I'm, I may have missed something, but if we are asking outside experts or those with relevant specialist knowledge to come into the, this committee, can we perhaps be given a heads up before it happens? Because there have been a number of occasions when they've been in here and we haven't known about it before we actually had the experts in. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And um, just before you, I get again consensus if there is one. I I would suggest that maybe you might want to move your work program item up on the agenda because often it's a bit of a poor relation in your discussions because everyone's exhausted at the end of the meeting. And and of course you are holding people who are here you know, back until they can speak, but it is a really important item and that kind of discussion could be more fruitful before well, energies are higher perhaps at meeting. Um, I can discuss that with the chair. And so can I have a, a consensus on table three that has been circulated to you on those items? Are we happy to go ahead? And is there consensus to hold briefings ad hoc? Great. Okay, so is there anything else? Is that, yep, we're we done. I think uh, we're at the end of the agenda, so meeting closed. Thanks, members. Thank you.